Hello and welcome to Excavations. And we're, today we're talking about the famous uh, essay by Chairman Mao, um, Combat Liberalism. I call it an essay. It's actually more of a speech that was republished as a pamphlet. And we'll talk about the context of the pamphlet too. Um, some things to remember about this. I mean, it, it, it became popular... I think in the in the West during the '60s, um, it was often quoted and circulated around those times, uh, particularly as a response to the seeming stalling out of the CPUSA, um, the kind of problems and shifts that happened with a lot of anti-revisionist groups in America and college campuses mostly. Um, so it's it's quotations in the Western world are it was also very popular in France in 1968 for similar reasons um, are kind of decontextualized from Mao's time period. Um, although Mao is obviously still alive and actually promoting the spreading of this you know pamphlet. So uh, the first thing we have to remember though that this is released after the Long March. Um, and in the middle, basically, of the Chinese Civil War. And for most of the early 20th century, from the fall of the uh, Qing Dynasty and the last emperor uh, up into 1949, China was at civil war most of the time. And if you look at the prior century, You'd had a series of rebellions such as the Taiping, et cetera, that had death counts that were world historic. Um, something like the bloodiest conflict in American history per capita, adjusting for population size, was the U.S. Civil War. The Taiping and Boxer Rebellions, I think, had six times the death of that. Um, so... It, the population loss that we're talking about during the late 19th and early 20th century are ginormous. And it actually is one of the things that makes a lot of anti-communist talking points about Mao's China really funny, because what you see, even during the Great Leap Forward, which is where there actually probably was a fair amount of starvation, I don't think there are some people who deny it, but I think even a lot of uh, Mao sympathetic scholars will say that that was real. Um you saw a pretty stark increase of both economic productivity and lifespan. Um, and that's with a famine. Um, so in some sense, there is a, like, you can't say that um, the Chinese revolution failed in that sense. Now what the nature of that revolution is, you know, is off debated. Um, and, particularly after the Sino-Soviet split, where this became, ironically, more used in the West because it was in the context of the Sino-Soviet split that a lot of radicals who were frustrated with the old guard of the communist parties in their home countries, the CPUSA and the Communist Party of France, uh, used Maoism as a way to break off from it, just like in a prior decade or so, Trotskyism had been used to break off from, uh, from the mainland parties. Although Trotskyism and the left opposition had a, you know, had a split that goes back way earlier, mm -hmm. um, you know, back to the 1920s. But the context for this is, is quite interesting. This is during Mao's consolidation of power in Yunnan province after his exile in the Long March. Um, Yunnan became the primary area of communist agitation. They're out in the middle of nowhere. They're helping peasants. Um, they are fighting a war with the Kuomintang, uh, with the Guomindang, but also they're also dealing with Japanese uh, invasions uh, by the late 1930s. So there's a need to impose discipline. Um, and that's really the context for this. The other thing you got to remember, I mean, I get sometimes frustrated with like Mao, Maoist theory because it's presented in the most simple forms. Um, I, I often say it reads like Taoist folk magic. It's a bit sloganeering, yeah, right. absolutely. But to defend Mao on this a little bit, um, 
this is actually aimed at largely illiterate peasants in a language that is hard to be literate in um, because of the complications of the intergrammatic writing style, which they simplify later. Um, and with a class structure, which we talked about in our other excavations episode with Dr. Kuba, right. um, which had intellectuals really removed from the common person, common worker, our common peasant's life. I mean, you had to be uh, a fairly rich peasant. Um, and by rich peasant, we don't really mean wit rich by any modern standards. Like Mao's, Mao's father was a, quote, rich peasant. They ate eggs like a few times a month. They wow. barely ate meat. I mean, we know this. Um, they could hire one farmhand etc but they also had enough money to send Mao to school because Mao was radicalized in college um would he have been considered a scholar by the chinese understanding of that term no okay but he would have been that. considered a potential scholar but he was not a scholar no um he was not he was not from the right class background um okay. uh he would be <clears throat> I, I don't want people to get mad at me for, for making this vulgar comparison and Chinese people, if you're listening, please forgive me, but he would be like the son of a redneck who made good. Um, that would be what he would be. So he would be considered D class a from our okay. standpoint, um, m kind of between social classes, highly educated, uh, uh, not poor by any, by, but by, by the standards of his day, Mm -hmm. But also not really rich. Um, and to say he was like upper middle class would be misleading because there really wasn't an upper middle class in this chi period of Chinese history. You were right. either really well off or you were relatively, you know, relative levels of shit. Sure. Um, That's or you were the like, level of stratification there with very little in between. Right. I mean, unless you were like a comprador bourgeoisie, which that means, um, which becomes a category in Maoism that I don't love that it's universalized. But it, what it meant in this time period specifically is that you made specific deals with Western powers to get a lot of capital. Um, start, and it goes back to uh the the portuguese colonization in macau, right yeah in macau yeah. but but it it spreads you know it becomes a category throughout um so it's interesting to think about it uh communi communist members were allowed to join the kmt on an individual basis as the guomandong uh, they were highly encouraged to because Stalin, and this is one of the things that even though Mao is a Stalin defender um, after the Khrushchev secret speech, and that's one of the big things that Mao uses to justify the sign of Soviet split. It's important to note that a lot of the problems that, that the, that the CPC have do go back to Stalin's attitude towards the CPC. So Stalin since marrying out, um, to represent uh, the Chinese to the common turn, and they don't make an alliance with the with the CPC. They make a they make an alliance with um, the KMT. Now, the logic for that, it, uh, one, Stalin still held that they needed a bourgeois revolution in China, which is interesting because, you know, in the Soviet Union, they were basically trying to skip that, but they were arguing that in China they needed it. Um, two, the KMT was just so much fucking larger. So uh, in 1922, there were about 300 members of the Chinese Communist Party. And a lot of them were like actually probably closer to anarchists. Kropotkin was more common in China, tra mm. being translated. Russian stuff was more common because it's closer um, than German stuff, which is where your second international communist stuff would have come from. Uh, but they would have heard about the 1917 revolution, and that's what causes the first burst of party membership. Now, it had grown massively in three years. I mean, it has like... 1500 uh members by 1925 but in 1923 the kmt had 50,000 members um sun yat sin uh w was involved with both hmm. and 
Sun Yat-sen uh, is the father of like multi-ethnic Chinese nationalism, so he was big on uh, the Han um, having their stake in their own state, but that all the nationalities need representation. And he talked about the five nationalities, and he included like the Western Muslims and the Tibetans and mm-hmm. um, uh, di- different groups. There's five groups he lists out specifically. This is actually the basis for com- uh, Communist Party policy in China today. Um, Interesting. Okay. So that's the multi-nations policy, et cetera. That goes back to Sun Yat-sen. Um, Sun Yat-sen was clearly aligned um, with both the Soviets, but also his attitude seemed very much in line with the Second International more than the Bolsheviks, to be frank. Um, but he dies in 1925, uh, very early on in this process. Um, so the KMT splits. So there's a left-wing KMT at that point and a right-wing KMT. Um, And the right-wing KMT was explicitly anti-Soviet. And by 1927, the right-wing KMT wins. And basically, uh, that leads to the Civil War. Um, And the CPC becomes the favored party. What's interesting is there were multiple communist parties in China, all right? So um, there's a lot of evidence now that there were about, there were over multiple different Marxist and communist parties, about 10,000 members in various communist parties, but they didn't get any Soviet support. Hmm. So um, the Soviet sent money and spies to help the CPC, and that's the one that stuck. Um, and the CPC was kind of recognized at the common term. Uh, I'm not going to go into the long history of the Shanghai massacre and the communist uh, insurgency and the communist insurgency really sort of ends in 1937, okay. um, which is right when this is coming up. All right. Um, so there's some key members here now mao is not really you know mao is not the first president of the cpc that's another thing people don't know um generally um i mean mao was not the the president anyways the chairman but communist the communist party of china or the chinese communist party um it its founding leaders were uh two people who ended up kind of opposed to each other um Which is uh, Chen Du Shu and Li Da Sao. Um, Chen Du Shu is later kind of kind of becomes a, a left oppositionist. He also thinks China's developmental process. I mean, he kind of agrees with both the initial common turn assessment and with the Second International that uh, he has a position that becomes closer and closer to that of like Plakhanov. If you know, if you know him from the Russian Revolution, that uh, that they needed more bourgeois development before they could attempt an actual revolution, that they would be impoverished. Otherwise, interestingly, if you kind of think about it, in some ways, even though he's repudiated still to this day by the Chinese Communist Party, um, Deng kind of is backdoor agrees with him <laughs> um, because that's what the justification for the opening up was: was bourgeois developmentalism. Um, but Tin Ju Shu, or and, and I'm sorry, Chinese speakers, I'm going to go ahead and apologize. Unless I hear it pronounced a lot, I'm going to butcher it. Um, I'm not terrible at Chinese, but I, I'm actually not good at reading pinyin, and I can't read Mandarin at all. Um, I know I know maybe 15 characters of Mandarin. I have no <laughs> idea how to pronounce them. I just know that that's bathroom, and that's woman, and that's tea. Um, Those are good so, ones to know, though. They're funny. They're, they're super useful when you're actually <laughs> in Asia, because um, they work in multiple countries. Um, That's also true. Anyway, um, uh, Chin was uh, was actually important. Uh, Chin Dushu, and that's why it's hard to kind of remove from the history of the party, because he was actually involved in the Xinhai Revolution, or the Xinhai Revolution. I'm not quite sure how you said that which overthrew the Manchu Qing uh, um, dynasty. So he's, he's kind of involved in national and like uh, national liberation. Um, He co-founded the, the CPC. Uh, 
uh, with Lee Dos How. Dos How was a big engineer, the United Front with the KMT. And his only major like contribution to uh, a communist a theory um, is theoretical. Um, he also dies in 1927, so he doesn't live long enough to really be super involved. I mean, he's he's dead uh, by the break it by the end of the KMT. Uh, communist popular front like he, he uh, but anyway he comes up with the idea it's unclear if he came up with the idea inspired by the Italian syndicalist or if it was completely separate um, and concurrent but he came up with the idea in the late in the early 1920s of the of the concept of proletarian nationhood, which is part of how they justified the alliance with the KMT. Hmm. And the reason why I bring that up is when we talk about who Mao's subject is, Mao does not use proletarian nationhood exactly in the in the way that uh, uh, Li Dazhao does. And I'm going to pronounce that different ways every time, hopefully getting one of them right. <laughs> um, uh, but he he does he's highly influenced by it that's like this idea of like the nation as a unit this is and this shows up actually specifically in maoist rhetoric there's a maoist rhetoric compared to other marxist rhetoric including other marxist leninist rhetoric like so the second international promotes the dictatorship of the proletariat uh, Lenin innovates the, the dictatorship of the proletariat and peasant in the deve- in the kind of periphery nations. He doesn't use periphery, but that's the idea. Like, okay, we have to include the peasantry because we're just not developed enough. Um, but that's a, a major shift. Um, Mao kind of talks about the oppressed classes. All right, so proletariat is still kind of in the lead, um, but sometimes that includes elements of the bourgeoisie which is something that's highly controversial even in Marxist-Leninist circles, that there's a progressive national bourgeoisie which can be allowed not just in a popular front like in the KMT, uh, but actually in the Communist Party itself. Um, so so what you hear from, in a lot of Maoist rhetoric that goes back to this proletarian nation thesis, is serving the people and the masses as opposed to serving the workers. Mm-hmm. Um, that certainly rings clear from my reading, and this was my first interaction with any Maoist literature. I was not a high school, uh, you know, red book kind of person. I picked up the Communist Manifesto instead, I think. But it was it was interesting, and um, I was wondering certainly about the subject and who it is that you know, he's referring to here, even in the case of who the enemy is in the context of this being within the period of the civil war, uh, the context that you've given now has clarified that to a certain degree, but it still seems like it can be multiple people. And now understanding that the bourgeoisie were an element, his repudiation of liberalism as belonging to the petty bourgeois as a, you know, kind of... Mm -hmm. It almost makes it out to be a lifestyle brand here as well. It's everything from a political ideology to a mindset to a set of behaviors, you know? Um, Well, one thing Maoism gets criticized for starting from this point is is, uh, conflating ideological or tactical positions with class positions. Mm Mm-hmm. that someone, someone like Mike McNair will often criticize Maoism for like making up whole new classes so that like you could make an ideological point as opposed to just making the ideological point. Um, and what I find interesting about liberalism from the standpoint, like if you look at what classical Marxism says about, say, fascism, like classical Marxism, we mean the second international and then third periodist third international so that is 19 that's around the same time period okay. uh, 1927 to 1936 um and the right opposition uh they all hold that basically um fascism it's bonapartist 
and thus given to the petite bourgeoisie and the lumpen and other aligned classes that are not fully in either class category. Mm. Um, which makes Mao's insistence that liberalism uh, is, a, is a function of the petite bourgeoisie actually really different from positions held by even other Marxist Leninists who would consider themselves anti-revisionists, such as, you know, people who like Stalin, basically. Stalin didn't hold to that theory. <laughs> right. And th it confuses things now because um, a lot of people who want to discuss this do not want to deal with the changes in official Maoism and particularly once it get develops in Latin America and in some cases even becomes a shooting incident, like people fighting each other. It's also important to remember that in 1963 that there's shots fired between the Soviet Union and China and they almost went to war. Um, and uh, this, this leads to China, like kind of sabotaging the Vietnamese uh, and the, and like working with the U S back door through Cambodia, it leads to all kinds of stuff. So, um, that's way later, though. And, and yeah, this but these are still consequences of right. the early formation. That's really interesting. Right. So in Yunnan, uh, I mean, and the other thing we have to think about Maoism, Maoism doesn't come to dominate, like, as a clear tendency until 1949, which means it only has two years in power before the secret speech happens. So even if there are tensions between Stalin's policy and China, because of trying to pivot to distance from Khrushchev, it may be sincere belief. It's actually hard to know. Um, Mao uh, has a soft critique of this, of this. Like he, for example, critiques the Yiz off China, um, which is the purges. Um, he... He has some critiques of Stalin. That's, you know, um, the 80%, 20% thing. 80% mm. uh, good, 20% bad. And they critique um, Khrushchev for historical nihilism, turning the people against the party, etc. Um, they, what they don't comment on was whether or not what Khrushchev said was true. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's an interesting uh, point that I'll remember as we get into his uh, list of manifestations of liberalism <laughs> yeah right <laughs> I think for um, reasons and it'll become obvious what's interesting enough. also is while this was while this speech was given in 1937 right well, why this speech was given in 1937, it's important for me now to talk about why, when it was published in China as a pamphlet, because that's different. All right. So 1937 is the, the kind of the end of the communist insurgency. There's a need to consolidate. They're out in Yunnan. The long march is over. Um, they're also now dealing with, I believe, Chinese invasions really start to happen. Uh, not Chinese invasions. Japanese invasions really start to happen. Um but uh, there's the uh, rectific there's the rectification movement, which was a purge in the Yunnan Soviet in 1941 to 1944, um, and it's there that Mao becomes unquestionably one of the leaders of the party with like Li Shuqi and Zhou Enlai and people like that, um, and Mao becomes the main figure. Um, he was he was a leader this entire like already. That's not the, that's not the point. But his leadership is unquestionable after this. Mm -hmm. um, and it was an attempt to instigate, quote, democratic centralism. How democratic it actually was, it's hard to know, because we're in the context of a civil war. Like um, and. And so that's when the rectification happened. Um there are upper end estimates that 10,000 people die during the rectification movements. I don't believe that. I, I like a lot of these stats from anti-communists tend to be greatly exaggerated. Um, also when they say deaths, uh, what we know is they weren't mostly or even primarily executions. Um, one of what the things about their all, sources, uh, you know, they're they're usually like 
extrapolating from Chinese population numbers um, oh. that were collected by different census groups. But again, in a time of civil war, good luck. Um, sure. Uh, there were there were executions. I'm not saying there weren't, but but the the uh, I I tend to see when people like give me large numbers in this. They usually have to be revised downward, <laughs> even by liberal historians, not just mm -hmm. by Chinese ones. Um, but one of the things when they say deaths, you notice they don't say executions. They don't say ten thousand executions, which with the purges you can say. Like sure. the purge, with the Yuzov China purges in Russia. And uh, for those of you who don't know why I say Yuzov China, that's the separated out from the Red Terror from 1921 to 1924 during the Russian Civil War uh, and from later purges. So I'm specifically talking about um, 1936, 37. Uh, let me see when the Yuzov China ends. Um uh the great purges so 36 37 38 um and then um there are still pretty bad purges that i think are indefensible under beria from like 38 to like 41 during the war but they really have to calm down because uh stalin's dealing with hitler <laughs> so um uh so anyway, so there is there is that. Um, so this is released as a kind of standard of what's what uh, Mao expects of party members during this like solidification phase in the early 1940s. If people think I'm kind of couching, you know, whether or not this is good or bad, it's because honestly, from reading the historical data, I can't tell how good or bad it was. It's, um, it does seem like there were some people who were purged and executed that did not need to be. Um, and there was, there was some key feminist scholars that were, that were, uh, although they, they weren't, killed in the rectification period ironically they died later but uh but it seems like a lot of the deaths were also suicide which is what i was about to mention during the anti-rightist campaigns and during the cultural revolution so that's in the the 50s and the 70s uh, a lot of the death toll numbers are skirmishes between factions not executions and then um mass suicide events after shamings so after a self-criticism there's a whole lot of suicide, which ironically I've always pointed out in the cultural revolution was like, well, one of the reasons why the death toll was so high was Confucianism, which was something they were supposedly trying to wipe out. Um, so it's, it, it's a, it's a weird uh, thing, but w this was published in 1942 to solidify this. And it's also got to be mentioned in the context of war. So the rectification campaign is particularly coming up because they're also having to fight the Japanese and the KMT at the same time. Yeah. Um, and so that is uh, where the intensity of the struggles come from. So I don't want it to make it sound like this is just a purges that happen in peacetime. This is absolutely not what's going on. But that is the context for the 1942 pamphlet, which really makes this readily available. Um, so some other things though, to just kind of like, and we can talk about your questions and actually read the text. Mm -hmm. um, some other things that I would uh, point out that are released in the same time period. Uh, um, there are statements after the communist insurrection ends up in, you know, Yunnan province chilling out. Um, and by chilling out, I mean linking its ruins after the long march in the 1935, um, where uh, China expresses solidarity with Spain. That's one of the things, one of Mao's first introductions to the Western world is a major interview that's done in 1936 around this time period. Um, so, uh, Mao was really becoming known to leftists and communists and socialists in the West at this time, although uh, um, not necessarily 
as like a key ideological figure more as a key military figure um because mao is and one thing you cannot take away from him he was a pretty amazing guerrilla general um all right so that's all the context i think you need to know um 1937 they're licking their wounds after the long march and being forced out during the communist insurrectionary period uh they're trying to, to survive in 1941 they're having we instigate a war in the context of a world war and they're having to fend off uh a chinese invasion um and beat the kmt back all at the same time so one of the reasons when they're like, well, 10,000 dead, I'm like, it's the context of a war. How do you know how these people are dying? But since you're not saying we don't have execution orders for them, like, um, which is also not to me say we don't know that there wasn't mass executions, but we just don't have. I will say this. We do not have documentary evidence of huge numbers of mass executions. Um, Very fair point. <laughs> um, so, I don't think it's dismissive at all. Yeah, I don't want to like say that they didn't that they for sure didn't happen either, but I don't have a lot of evidence for them. All right. So, uh but but I think there's I think when we talk about this and you ask some good questions, uh, there's some weird things in Maoism and I say weird. There are things that make Maoism distinct. Mm -hmm. And particularly Mao what we should call this by what it's called later. Oh um, my. Maoism is never called Maoism. Maoism is anti-revisionism Mao Zedong thought. And initially, okay. Mao Zedong thought was considered unique to China, like it's specifically for China. Mao Zedong thought did not have aspirations for this to be applied all over the world. And what it is changes dramatically in various decades. All right. So like uh, this is but some things are consistent, like this focus on the people uh, a mass popular front of the oppressed classes. Um a need and acceptance of national development and the idea of proletarian nationhood mm -hmm. um, and kind of a kind of, a, you know, and I think this goes back to the way the Chinese were treated by Stalin, actually, to point that out again, that there is a distrust that even though the, CT, uh, the CPC got support from the USSR, um, the fact that their support was so provisional for so long kind of put a, a bad taste in their mouth in regards to both the common turn and later on the Warsaw Pact. So uh, interesting. I've always been so curious about what drew um, particularly students in, in the sixties uh, from America and apparently in France as well to Maoism. And I'm wondering, is this a particular period um, when we're, we're starting to read combat liberalism here that is interesting to them is this what they're looking at is it the later period of of mouth thought so one thing that you have to remember about the end of the cruise ship period and beginning of like brezhnevian normalization and what we call soft neo-stalinism and all that um is that it encouraged the strategy of patience to the point that sometimes communist parties in countries like france or chile Mm -hmm. We're taking positions on relationship to bourgeois powers to the right of socialist parties, um, other Marxist Leninist parties, etc. And um, and in the context of the national liberation movements, if you're trying to play off, if you're a you know a communist or or a, 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 or an independence nationalist trying to navigate between the Western powers and the Soviet Union, having a non-aligned bloc is very useful for you. Um, but in Latin America in particular, because there was a lot of outreach done, um, and there's a lot, a lot of outreach done to disenfranchised members of like black communism. So for, for example, in the United States, this is maybe uh, something to be understood. Mm -hmm. Like... Um, the CPUSA had supported like black civil rights movements and all that pretty thoroughly up through McCarthyism in so much so that like almost every black writer of import that you know of was at one time getting support from the communist party sure. in the United States that starts to end in the early 1960s. And there's also a lot of critiques um, in the communist party 
that it's not taking racial concerns seriously enough anymore, even though it did largely as a result of the popular front and having to maintain a coalition with the Democrats. Hmm. Um, and the Democrats, we must remember at this time period, were still accepting in large numbers and their largest constituency was in the South were segregationist. Um, this increase. So even though you have the communist party doing pretty radical things and supporting black arts and organizing black people into unions, et cetera, defending them when they're kicked out, um, providing middle-class incomes for, for certain black intellectuals. Um, they are still in a popular front with the democratic party. Um, and while there is a, there's the beginning of what, you know, would later be called Nexus and Southern strategy, which really kind of begins with Goldwater, mm -hmm. um, which separates off the black vote from the Republican party, uh, completely. I mean, the black vote was in the democratic party's hands starting in the 1930s for economic reasons. Uh, although that should be put with a caveat though, most black people in the areas where there's the most black population could not vote. Mm -hmm. So uh, the black vote is not really representative uh, during the 1930s, but in so much that we had any, it was going to the Democrats. But before that, from, from, from the civil war to right before FDR, uh, blacks voted Republican. Um, and it looked like it might go back that way. Um, in the early 1960s, um, but on freedom of association grounds, Goldwater opposes uh, the Civil Rights Act. Um, and that starts the shift, right? Well, anyway, th this, this tension, um, however, after the communists are purged, from the unions um, after uh, Taft Hartley um, and they're pursued by HUAC. They're in a very bad state. They've lost a ton of membership um, uh, between 1949 and 1961. Like, like the, the CPUSA went from being like 50,000 people back down to being like, 5,000 people, or I think at this point it's about 10,000 people, but it, it, it had lost a vast majority of its membership. Um, did, where did they go? A lot of them just became Democrats. A lot of them disappeared okay. into private life. Um, sure. a, lot of, a lot of the more prominent ones left the country mm -hmm. uh, to Canada or Europe. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, that's a good question. It's a question that's often not asked. Um uh, about because like for example we're about to come up on a mass commu a new communist movement a good portion of which was anti-revisionist uh, of some variety Hojas, mostly Maoists, different kinds of Maoism though that's why I mentioned Mao Zedong thought because there's Mao Zedong thought Maoist uh, Marxist Leninism Maoism Marxist internationalist Maoism um, and socialism and Chinese characteristics these and none of these, except for maybe sometimes the latter, um, are distinctions that I hear spoken about today at all. So socialism and Chinese characteristics is the official current ideology of the CPC, sure. as revised by Deng. Mao Zedong thought was the was a was a shifting ideology and a series of justifications come up with by the Chinese from 1959. I mean 1949, but particularly really doesn't really kick off. Uh, separate until after the secret speech. So 19, so 1940, uh, 1953, 54, um, up to and ending with the cultural revolution. So 1976. Okay. Um, and it's actually int what's interesting about it. It's, it's not making claims for all communist nations. It's specifically only making claims for China and air er and countries specifically in Chinese situations, which is, at this point presented as pretty unique. All right. Um, now the, the, the emphasis on Mao Zedong thought really intensifies as the Sino-Soviet split intensifies after 1963. So one of the things that we talk about this right here, this is before all that. Yeah. Like the reason why it's interesting is you begin to see some of the tendencies that are going to be unique to Maoism. Mm 
I do think show up a little bit in this speech. Okay. Um, interesting. But they are not. Uh, I mean, and this is a very short speech. You can read all kinds of stuff into it. Yeah. But they are not like fully instantiated. Now, of those two tendencies, only two of them are indigenous to China. So that is Mao Zedong, uh, Marxist Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought, and um, uh, socialism and Chinese characteristics, the, the Dungist revision. Okay. Um, which becomes like the formal policy, which shifts, you know, it's it shifted a lot to from Deng through Xi Jinping, through Hu Jintao to Xi. Mm -hmm. But th there are certain like, we need to develop developmental forces. We need to develop non-imperialist international alternatives, but we're not going to have a common term. We're not even requiring communist development. We're focusing on national development. Um, uh, we're going to have detente with the Western powers for real, though, um, including pursuing favored nation status with the United States uh, for a long time. Um, we're, you know, so we're going to use this to develop f uh, forces within the the communist world, etc. Um, now, I have my critique of a lot of that. Like, mm -hmm. I've pointed out that, yes, China got a lot wealthier, but for the vast majority of Chinese reduction of poverty, most of which has happened in the last 40, 45, 50 years, the biggest jumps and increases uh, of, uh, of the removal of the party are very recent, or they're actually in the, in the 60s and 70s, as are the biggest jumps in productive capacity. Um, what you actually see in the Deng period is the beginning of accumulated wealth in certain individual hands although admittedly even though china t today has more billionaires than the united states if you figure that out per capita it's still like nothing comparatively per capita um per capita with china is always slightly problematic <laughs> yeah um so there's a lot of comparisons um uh but in a real sense, like a lot of the anti-poverty work actually happens before Dung, particularly in the countryside. There's a lot of relief of urban poverty during the early Dungist period. And I think that does need to be acknowledged. Um, and then there's been a lot of relief of rural poverty in the absolute sense recently. Um, there's still like 20% of the of uh, China that makes less than five dollars a week or a day, which is the middle income poverty minimum minimum, which is still kind of crazy to think about. Um, Mexico is that mostly an in interior China? Yeah, that's an in interior China in and underdeveloped areas in the countryside. It, okay. um, but uh, there's increasingly social services for them that had kind of gone away during the Dung period. So one of the things that I have to give Xi credit for is reforming the medical insurance program because China's medical insurance program is weirdly not super socialized. It's become more so in the last mm -hmm. 10 years. Okay. Um, and it was totally socialized in the Mao period, but it was also like, it was doctors that were, you know, the barefoot doctors period. One of the things about the barefoot doctors period though, that I want to point out that while we're giving Mao props for stuff he actually succeeded on, mm -hmm. uh, despite the fact that, Literally, some of what they were doing was snake oil because they didn't have anything else to work off of. And I say literally because that's where some of the ideas come from. Um, like traditional Chinese medicine is encouraged during this period. A lot of even Chinese scholars think it was invented during this period. Interesting. But um, it largely worked. And so, so to, like, so when you hear that and you hear like Westerners scoffing at China about, you know, oh, the barefoot doctors the biggest increases in life expectancy in China were during this time period. Um, and so, I'm sure it produced a, a large amount of doctors after um, they managed mm -hmm. to get so many kids into school. Right. Um, one of the things that happened though, during the, dung, during the dung period is like rural education is disinvested in, and this is like not talked about by a lot of dung fans in the West. Um, interestingly, I only know this from Chinese scholars some of whom are big fans of G, but they're Maoist. And they, and like when you mention uh, Deng Xiaoping, they kind of spit. Um, so it's uh, Deng, uh, Deng Pinghan, Mo Bo Gao, 
uh, these are the people that, uh, that have uh, really informed my opinion on this and showed me the stats, uh, which on this, on their work on this, I find pretty convincing. And the stats from the UN and the United States actually don't contradict this. Like they, they all line up. Um, so, which makes some of the like crazy death tolls you get about Mal, like Mal's the biggest murderer in human history. That's real hard to justify when you like look at all the the increases of life expectancy and whatnot that happened. Which is not which again is not saying there wasn't severe periods of violence, but. There, it wasn't systemic in the way it was in the Soviet Union, right? Right. Um, there were not systemic. There was no like systemic purges with huge mass show trials and a lot of death mm -hmm. uh, with, with public executions and whatnot. What about uh, with the landlords? Oh yeah, but this is not to say that lots of people weren't killed. No, of course, no. But um, I'm asked. Those were public. Correct? Yeah, yeah, but th those are, a lot of that actually happens actually during the 1930s. Okay, interesting. And if so we're they're stuck killing in that period for a second before we get to the text. I want to know now that I have this background that there was a sort of um, Chinese conceptualized stagism, whereby there was you know a desire for bourgeois revolution to to lead up to socialist revolution. Did the thinkers you know pre Mao? Um, have the same conception of liberalism as he did in light of that? No, no they did okay. not. And uh, the other thing I'll say is the stagism, Mao kind of, I'm going to make Maoist angry, but he kind of has it both ways. Okay. Because the Cultural Revolution partly is an attempt to debureaucratize the party, but also to fight capitalist rotors, which is something that you hear people now. I was reading uh, Carlos Garrido, and he like blames us on the West. I'm like, no, that was an internal critique to China itself. Interesting. Um, uh, they were like, we have to get rid of the capitalist rotors in the party. They're doing too much developmentalism and not, you know, having us having our unique socialist uh, outlook. Um, the developmentalists don't win really till dong. Like, so there's this kind of, there's this kind of immediatist thing. And what's different from the Soviet Union is the Soviet Union still kind of holds on to the whole Marxist conception of, uh, you need an international, like it would, like it would have been best if the German revolution would have happened. So we could have joined up with that. But if not, we're going to have to like join up with, the Warsaw Pact and then develop our own internal capacities, but we're still trying to join up with revolutions elsewhere eventually to, to have the full capacity for world socialism, even in the Bukharin's slogan, socialism in one country, neither Bukharin nor Stalin really meant it that it was going to stop in, in the Soviet Russia. I mean, the one, the USSR is not one country. Two, you already have non-USSR communist states in, in the Warsaw Pact. Um, but they really did need, initially, um, one of the, you know, one of the revolutions of the Second International to win, and they needed to heal the First and Second International riff. Um, and that didn't happen. By the time you get to Mao, there's literally, like, there's a focus that you on uh, uh, autonomy and almost autarky in a way that you don't see um in in even soviet uh Stalin, like even so in stalin's uh marxist leninism mm -hmm. um there is this need to go it alone and not we don't necessarily need to uh join up with the rest of the world until we're fully developed into a socialist country I, I do think. Uh, do you think that, that the that you know geographical isolation sort of of China played into that as much as anything else? Or? Well, I mean, but isn't Russia also pretty fucking geographically isolated? Sure, and but it does. It still, it was at least contiguous, mostly with with the rest of the federated Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, like, but what is China's biggest border? Russia. It's it's the Soviet Union. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Okay, fair point. Um, so like, I mean, in some ways, the Sino-Soviet split is a is a disaster for world socialism because mm -hmm. like, 
if you believe, and I'm not here to blame either the Chinese or the Russian side. I tend to take the Chinese side early on, but then later on, I tend to think the Russians had a fucking point after what China, China was doing, like in regards to to Cambodia and mm -hmm. in Latin America. Um, but in the beginning, I kind of see I see their point. I see China's point. Um, the the fact that you don't have literally the two landmass largest nations on earth joining up. That's a huge loss. Absolutely. Right. And then the other thing that complicates it is tensions between the Soviet union and, uh, and China make the non-aligned movement really hard because there's tensions between India and China to this day. Um, that start in this time period okay. because the Congress party, which are nationalist and, but there's a large contingent of the Congress party, which are like the left KM, uh, KMT. They're, they're basically social Democrats and the Soviet union is making uh, forays into working with them. But like, um, The Congress Party's representative, like Narendra Gandhi and whatnot, they come head to head with like Zhou Enlai in in uh, in the non-aligned conferences, and there's tensions there too. So, like, if you think about what could have happened, you would have had a block outside of the Western world, contiguous from Russia to to India. You know, the which is when we talk about BRICS. I'm not going to get into that. Um. But that would have been literally both in land mass and in population, the largest part of the world. And that did not happen because yeah. of events. And I don't want to blame either side solely because I, like I said, I actually think in the early parts of the Sino Soviet split, I, even though I like Khrushchev and a lot of people hate him, I'm just going to go ahead and put that out there. <laughs> um, uh, I, I do not. I do not think China was in the wrong in a lot of ways, but what they do after 1963 is very hard to justify. Anyway, to go back to this and all this context is to say that this happens in the beginning of this. It's after the first is after the first insurgency with the KMT. Um, it's released as a pamphlet later on. Mm -hmm. Um, during a consolidation period and it's also important to note during this con consolidation period it, you know for we have to like give them some credit uh the communists kicked the ass of both the japanese and the kmt they chased the kmt into chi into taiwan where they mm -hmm. still are to this day yes um they they help the allied forces kick the shit out of out of Imperial Japan. Now this gets complicated because there's also weird shit going on in Russia. Um, and during the same time period in the early, you know, during this early fifties, China takes huge losses, uh, supporting Stalin's people in the DPRK. So, which is also a sore point later on. Um, so like China takes tons of losses supporting the, uh, uh the North Korean government. Um, and, you know, they don't take that position in regards to Vietnam. Um, and tensions between, and that's important to understand because even though ideologically you would think Marxist Leninist states have opened up to the world, uh, have a nominally similar ideology, um, more Absolutely. similar, <laughs> yeah, more similar on paper than, say, the DPRK does to China, for example. Sure. Um, but uh, Vietnam and China still to this day don't really get along. Um, so, okay, that's that's all that background. Let's get into the actual speech so you can ask let's, your questions because because I just gave you an hour of history and people will be like it's only <laughs> only ten percent of that hour is actually about the speech. <laughs> well, it's a short speech. I you know I think you you certainly already answered um, my my first question about. Mao's national ideological and social construction and how he localized Marxism in China. So yeah. carry on, um, Kelly Ho. 
All right. So let's actually read the speech and we can talk about its implications. And But I will warn you that I have a question or a comment or a question comment for almost every single one of the list of 11 manifestations of liberalism. So let's go to it. All right. We stand for active ideological struggle because it is a weapon for ensuring unity within the party and for the revolutionary organizations in the interest of our fight. Every communist and revolutionary uh, should take up this weapon. Any questions? I'm just stopping for <laughs> sentence because these are these are very simple sentences. I just read a paragraph. They really are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I'm I'm curious as active ideological struggle, a structure, blah, blah, blah. active ideological struggle as a as a weapon. Um, how do you weaponize ideological struggle exactly? What does this mean? So, I think this means actually having a cohesive set of ideas and conceptions of what constitutes a party and what you're fighting for. Um, so, the idea is the party should, and this does not start with Marxist Leninism. Actually, this goes back to the Second International. Um, <laughs> So there's often an accusation, for example, against Karl Kotsky that he voted for the war credits when he didn't. Um, what he did was abstain from the vote and did not let his vote be known because the principle of democratic centralism, which he adopted, uh, that the party should stand unified and only let its let its differences be known to outsiders. Uh meant that he would not share his actual vote, which was to abstain. And later on, he would only he would find it unbearable and eventually leave, although he's criticized uh, by Lenin a lot um, in the early 1920s, and actually even as early as uh, 1915, for not leaving earlier and not leaving with the right people. Um, so, and thus actually making an excuse for... Ebert and the Social Democrats who were for the war. Um, okay, that doesn't seem related to this, but it actually kind of is. This led to, I think it's the 21 principles. I always forget the number. But when the Bolshevik uh, um, program of 1918, which is now published as the ABCs of Communism, is written by Bikarin and Prezovrinsky. Oh, man. Russians, I'm so sorry. This is going to be a lot of me apologizing for names. Um, anyway, the, that the, it, those two figures end up being both the right and left opposition, so that 1918 thing isn't talked about much. But ideological cohesion is part of the um, conditions of joining the new common turn, uh, the Third International, which is requires ideological unity in a way that the second international does not and requires you to kick out non ideological members. This actually is why like the SP a begins to split. That's why there's like this, this causes splits in the socialist movement all over the world. Okay. Um, that is the beginning of the idea of an ideological struggle for <laughs> ideological for a purer program being fundamental to socialism and communism. And that's kind of what Marx is refer I mean that Marx Mao is referring to here. All right. Whereas in the first international and the second international, there were very broad based principles. I mean, in the first international, you didn't even have to be a fucking communist. Like you could be a blankiest, uh, various kinds of non Marxist socialist. Etc. Mm -hmm. In the Second International, there was still a very wide spectrum of what was okay. Um, in the Third International, there is not. Um, there, there. It's not that there's, and this leads to you know things that I think are a disaster. But the, um, it leads to why there's so many splits in Marxist-Leninist sects and in Trotsky sects, because there's a ban on factions after the, after 1921. And, and that has never dropped. It is it is instituted by Lenin in the context of the Russian Civil War, but it is maintained forever. Um, and also Trotsky's parties maintain it. Uh, whereas earlier parties thought that like, well, democratic centralism, but you can have factions and all this. Just keep your fights within the party and don't let mm. it be known to outside. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So in a way, the ideological unity is to blame for you know, sectarian disunity. 
Right. But it's interesting because it means something very different. We experienced this through the lens of basically the new left and the sectarian left of the late 50s, 60s, 70s, particularly after 1969 in the United States, 1968 in, in France. Um, interesting, this doesn't touch... <laughs> it touches Britain, but Britain, it, it touches them less. Um, the... Uh, and that's why this sectarianism gets associated with student movements. But we have to remember, like, this is coming out of places that are in active civil wars and active war zones. And so, like, this is not me to say this was this is a this is a good idea. In fact, I think one of the reasons why the USSR was so fragile was the faction ban. Sure. Um, that while it may have made sense during the civil war to maintain it, meant that you needed purges pretty much constantly. Um, and that's also a problem in China. While the purges aren't the same level and whatnot, you have many, many purge campaigns. Like, there are more of them in China than there are in the USSR, even though they never get to the kind of, like, formal Volume. execution sure, okay. machine that you get uh -huh. in, uh, in, in the USSR. Interesting. So the, the principles of this... Um, ideological struggle were well laid out by this point. Yeah, and 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 I think that's something you need to like, and that's not unique to Mao. Like that goes sure. back, that goes back to the Bolshevik uh, nineteen eighteen program. Okay. I think that's my contention anyway. Great. All right. Let's carry on. But liberalism rejects ideological struggle and stands for unprincipled peace, thus giving rise to a decadent Philistine attitude and bringing about political degeneration in certain units and in individuals in the party and the revolutionary organizations. What I find interesting about this, I'm going to comment on this one. This is one of the things that's often cited by like people who are fighting like intersectional liberals today, but that's not what this meant in 1937. Um, this meant, I guess a kind of like tendency to want peace so that we can get back to business um, if I'm taking it as an ideological stance at all, one of the things that's often criticized by Trotskyists and whatnot of this pamphlet is like, they'll just, and I know even some Maoists will say this, to be honest, that like, there's not really any class content in this very much. It's more about good principles for maintaining organization in wartime yeah, and just naming it liberalism because that's effective because we don't like liberals. So. <laughs> that's what it reads like. Yeah. <laughs> um, which, which I do think does actually really do manifest in our sectarian organizations where everybody calls every fucking thing liberal. So without... we get to blame Mao for shit libs like, as a terminology? That's fantastic. <laughs> in, in some ways. I mean, um, the love me, I'm a liberal thing is, it comes out of this. But yeah. Marx actually complains about this a hundred years before where he was talking about like, yeah, we, we damn everything as liberal that we don't like, like That's it's, it's on everybody's lips, left, right, and center. Marx actually comments on this in the 1840s. Wait, it, um, what is that uh, written in? Oh, I think a, it's a letter. It sounds around, like a letter that doesn't sound yeah, like something. That it's a letter. Write a it's book. a letter. It's not in a book, um, but I, I've read it. Um, and he's not defending liberalism, but he's just complaining about like no one even know, like everybody hates liberalism. So to call something liberal doesn't always clarify anything. Sure, in in our world of um, floating signifiers, I thought that reading this would give me a clearer conception of no. It's going to do the but opposite. By the end, I was not the case at all. Yes. Um, but I, I will try to give that reading. Uh, that first statement, I do think you can see it in a class context that like. Like if you're, uh, particularly when you consider that they were they were in league with until the insurrection, until you know ten years before, um, with the KMT, like they're like, oh well, you guys want peace at any price before we get all these things we need to get done done, um, because you want to go back to business and go back to exploiting people, and so we can't have that, right? right. Um, but. In Yunnan in 1937, I don't know how many fucking business people there are. <laughs> like, like to be honest, I don't think there's large amounts of actual effective petty bourgeoisie hanging out with communists in exile in the mountains. Sure. And um, there is something funny about calling them Philistine, because for me, that's always going to 
you know, bring an image of uncultured people in, in the literal sense of like high culture. And yeah, I, I wonder <laughs> what the Chinese term is there. Yeah, um, Because yeah. I, I do think that's got to be a translation thing. I do not think Mao would have been invoking Phil. I might be wrong. It, but yeah. that seems an awful Western cultural expl- expression. Certainly, yeah. Um, I if have anything, to... they would have their own like ancient peoples to bully on, right? There and <laughs> not the Philistines. Um, I have checked though that the word in Mandarin uh, from a friend is the word that we would associate with liberalism, and it is. It's not okay, like a, that's it's a not very that's not a translation issue. Good, good. Uh, there but yeah all right liberalism manifests itself in various ways that's one sentence by the way um and it has no colon um and this is not me making fun of mao i just want people to know that i'm not reading no that. but this like, is like where it's so clear that you know that it's a pamphlet and it made a lot of sense when you told me it, that it was um a speech as yeah well. i mean it makes total sense as a speech or a pamphlet in simplified Chinese for peasants to read who you've just and, educated. Right. right. And like, it reminds me a bit of like Buddhist mnemonics. I wonder if, if that carries over with like Confucianism or Taoism. Or so one of the like funniest that. things that I got, and, and I might have one around here when I was in the airport in Beijing. Um, and this was a decade ago, but they have these Tonkas, you know, Tonkas, mm-hmm. uh, they had them to Mao all over the airport. What? And I, I when I was in Chinese uh, restaurants in like Egypt, when I when I lived in Egypt, I would see them in there too. And I'd oh. be like, that's wild. That like wild. that. Um uh, but anyway, so <laughs> so so uh that's so cool. Did he have like you know, like mystical fire around him and stuff like that. No, no, it was just red, but it was oh. <laughs> actually it did have it did have that brocade though. Yeah, um, that's so crazy. But it was it was mounted like a like a Sino Tibetan Tonka, Tonka, which is not for those of you who think that's just Tibetan Buddhism. It's actually part of Chinese Buddhism altogether. Although the weird deities being hidden on it aren't. That's kind of unique to Vajrayana. We're really off topic. Let's get back to. It. <laughs> Um, uh, to let things slide for the sake of peace and friendship when a person has clearly gone wrong and refrain from principled argument because he is an old acquaintance, a fellow townsman, a schoolmate, a close friend, a loved one, a colleague, and uh, or an old subordinate are to touch lightly instead of going into it thoroughly as to keep on good terms. The result is both the organization and the individual are harmed. This is a type of liberalism. Now, As advice, I'm not sure that I always agree with this one. This one, this one, it depends on how you interpret it. Like the idea of going hard, you can see how this leads to crazy sectarianism later. Uh, I think about like the Japanese Maoists who self criticize themselves to death. Yeah. um, Until there was literally almost none of them left. Um, And. So I think this can be a principle that is often abused. However, I do think there's an interesting thing about this. The result is both the organization and the individual are harmed. So this is not like go and eradicate all these members. Like it is. No, you can't. You can't not point out a difference just because you want to tread lightly. You have some affinity. right? Right. So there you go. So the. The the means of doing that is my first question here. What is principled argument? How you know does one touch on a matter thoroughly within Maoism? Is there some sort of roadmap for for this? I mean, or a greater understanding? No. How is it? Achieved? No, you would have a fucking argument. I don't know. There's no formal. We don't formal process everything, Jordan. <laughs> it <laughs> kind of sounds like it, and it could because he invokes this kind of thing, and it seems like I, like you know, go it to is like where struggle three session. A in the manual. Yeah, it is where struggle sessions come from eventually. Sure. Um, but that's that's a much later thing. That's not mm-hmm. this early. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. That's that's cultural revolution. That's thirty years from now. All right. Um, that's the late sixties, not the late thirties. Okay. Um, and there's some of that in the rectification campaign. So when you think about this being republished by Mao as a pamphlet in 1942, um, it makes sense that this would be in there because he's saying like, look, you got to point out our differences. We have to solidify. You have to point these people out. Got to um, throw grandma under the bus. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But anyway, okay. Uh, and, and another that I that I um you know he says uh, 
former subordinates. And that kind of makes me think in terms of, you know, hierarchy and authority within a party itself as well. Mm -hmm. Like this sounds like a, a top down sort of a scenario. Are you meant to confront superiors within party leadership with the same degree? Well, you are later. You're right. not yet. Okay. So like, but that's part of the, again, cultural revolution. That's what you, that's part of what's going on there. Yeah. Um, okay. Interesting. Uh, and this is part of the terms of grievance where, like, anybody in the party, if they have a, a grievance, they can eventually theoretically take that grievance to the top and get redressed. That's the idea. Okay. Um, but you have to go through formal processes and it has to go through democratic and bureaucratic centralism, et cetera. Here we're um, still on the level of sort of interpersonal relationships. And it, yeah. it sounds like, you know, the for, forum for approaching someone is still interpersonally here but that seems to change in coming points. yeah the next one changes that to yeah. indulge in irresponsible criticism in private instead of actively putting forward one suggestions to the organization to say nothing to people to their faces but gossip behind their backs or to say nothing at a meeting but to gossip afterward to show no regard at all for the principles of collective life but to follow one's inclinations this is a second type of liberalism. So this is, I mean, he's saying that here is like, okay, so you're not just going along to get along. You're, you're making the criticisms, but you're not doing it in formal channels and you're not doing it where people will know what's going on. And it's basically a whisper campaign or a harassment campaign. Sure. We can't have that either. This has to be adjudicated by the collective. Interesting. Right. So we're also now condemning disregard for the principle of collective life in mm -hmm. favor of individualism, not just for interpersonal reasons, but within the group itself. Right. So <laughs> maybe this is a bit like pedantic, but uh, the first, you know, eager, honest question that comes to me is, does one have to share every critical thought they have within the group? Is there room for personal reflection or bouncing ideas off of comrades before presenting to all? It sounds like no. <laughs> Frankly, at least I the mean, latter. they never actually w made everybody talk and air everything. <laughs> like, like, there's no way to do that. That would be an impossible task. There would be no uh, time for dinner. After yeah. That. Although, again, like you can see here, the kinds of stuff that's going to come up in the Cultural Revolution because, um you're supposed to, you know, handle these, these differences, uh, the, you know, this way. And there's a lot of accusations by Western scholars and sometimes it's unjust and sometimes it isn't in my personal opinion mm -hmm. that this was a way for Mao to keep power because people could come at, uh, other people in the, in the communist party, but they couldn't really come at him, but it was a way to like check all the other, major power players, but without the kind of like ripe everybody out uh, approach of the Yuzhov China and what, and what Stalin's accused of doing to the old Bolsheviks. So, right. um, although, you know, Mao did execute people. I don't want to make it sound like he didn't, um, but it, you generally, and there's some that I, I, I kind of think were really bad calls. Like uh, Lu Xiaoqi, I don't think, you know, was justified at all. But um, there's there's a lot of this, but there's also a lot of ways in which, like, for example, uh, Dung, if you think of Dung like Bukharin, well, Bukharin dies and Dung doesn't. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. Um, anyway, to pick this back up yeah. uh, before I'm accused of being either an anti-Chinese zealot or a uh, Mao apologist. I feel like there's no way to talk <laughs> about this stuff without getting criticized by <laughs> both. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's fine. Just come yeah. out in front of it. We'll be fine. It's just like I'm probably depending on your perspective. I'm guilty of both things. Um, <laughs> exactly. A lot uh, of those people just argue amongst themselves and then get to you once they've come to some sort of consensus. Yes, yes, exactly. Bring this up to your party and have your party adjudicated. And once exactly. once Chairman G tells me that I'm out of line, I'll listen. Then, then we'll listen. Um, <laughs> if I get a letter. Yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, I, you know, on this though, I kind of agree with like, I, 
I know people talk about whisper campaigns as like the, the voice of the voiceless, but they're also a way to just exercise a shit ton of charismatic power. Um, and, and they are damaging the organizations. It is better to like hash it out in public. I mean, like so far, uh, when we got into these principles, the first one, I'm like, well, you could, you could justify all kinds of crazy shit and people do. I mean, you think about like, like, uh, Marxism, uh, Leninism, Maoism, Galonzo thought where Mm -hmm. like everything is violent struggle all the time. Um, shiny path basically that you can see where people reading some of this could get that Mm -hmm. that's not really at least at this point what i think is going on particularly in 1937 but Mm -hmm. even in 1942 i don't think they're really like killing massive numbers of people over minor disagreements um i do think they're trying to encourage people they're basically saying here like Hold the line. Bring out your opinion if you if you don't if you don't hold the line. But the line is decided collectively by the organization. So if you don't bring out your your opinion, you're actually and not giving us all a chance to like even adopt it. Um, all right. Anyway, to I think the other thing that we should note, since we're only like two and then getting to the third, is that we have two metrics really for judging each of these statements. One of is like you know. Do we Are they agree? Good is it effective? Is it a good uh, advice? And the second is: is this does this describe liberalism? And that my In answer way, was like, reform. no. That, mm-hmm. yeah. Like I'm sure liberals act like this, but there's nothing inherent to liberalism that has anything to do with these two things at all. Sure, I'm with you so far. Yes. <laughs> all right. Because okay. these are all really about personal behavior. That's what um, I get about a, a lot of this as well. And he he dives into like. Um, this is the, the way that the mind of a liberal works later on. So it's like a very psychological and normative stuff. Okay. When I guess if you consider the, the the one of the unifying definitions of liberalism to be individualism, there is a vague waff of truth to this. Definitely. But the, but I would say, and a lot of Marxist, both Trotskyist and Marx, Leninist, uh, uh, you know, classical Stalinists have pointed this out. That it's still like the class analysis kind of tacked on in one sentence at the end does not hold at all. Sure. Um, and I th- I mean, you can probably make some pretty good arguments that Marx cared about individuals and his appeals to them. Oh, uh, yeah, he, he absolutely did. I mean, the party life was not about totally subjugating yourself to the party. And that's another thing that, like, I think if you. um, You, you don't deal with this in some way. This this can be a, a problem. But I also think like this is still like so far as like items of behavior, except if you take the first principle to an extreme, um, this is not bad advice of how you behave in an organization that could have any kind of organizational effectiveness. When when what you're seeking is effectiveness and unity, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Around like, I- ideological principles that everyone abides by. Are, any principle at all, not just ideological principles. Like, just, Fair. yeah, absolutely. Like, have you worked in a job? Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, three, correct? To not, yeah, to not let things drift if they do not affect one personally, to say as little as possible without knowing perfectly well what is wrong, to be worldly wise and play it safe and seek only to avoid blame. This is the third type. Nothing to say there. I do. Um, I said, what does drift mean here? Um, is it like slide in point one? If so, that seems kind of redundant, although the motive is, is selfish instead of interpersonal, or is it something else? Then again, uh, playing it safe to avoid blame can also be in service of interpersonal. So my only pushback <laughs> to you is you're, even though, Jordan, you speak multiple languages better than I do, <laughs> you're reading this as if it was drafted in English. <laughs> like... <laughs> No, but I do. I really wonder, like, if someone would clarify what he means here. Um, you know, to let things why, drift. Why, I think he just means, he means, like, to not say anything because it doesn't directly affect you, even if you think it's wrong. It could be also if drift, you know, it you let something slide the first time, but then you watch it drift away slowly afterward, like you've had several in- 
<laughs> opportunities for intervention that you've missed until that point. Maybe it's also a matter of time passing. All right. To not obey orders, but to take pride of one's place, uh, one's own opinion, to demand special consideration for the organization, but to reject its discipline. This is a fourth type. This actually does go back to Ingalls. Ingalls has something in Critique of the Air Effort Program. Really? Uh, where he, yeah, he talks about we have equal rights, but we also have equal responsibilities and duties. I can totally get behind that. I do find it slightly contradictory to point to if the party demands obedience and one's personal critique, uh, critique is is contrary to that order, are you still meant to dissent? Can you see how this leads to well, argument to split? Yeah, is airing every critical thought at all times not demanding special consideration to its oneself either? Like, again, it kind of comes down to how, you know, things are decided. If it's a, you know, democratic process through the group, if it's top down, if it's about certain types of um, state obedience to, to principles that have been preconceived, then I don't know, like how... It, it seems to me that we're, we're pigeonholing people into having to voice critique when it's critique of someone else not following the rules, you know, and that's in a way. Oh, no, this is like a, out of it. this is this is a snitch. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, this is a, yeah. this is a snitch journal. I mean, like, like they can't get around that element of this, like sure. particularly when we get to the next two points. Um, yeah. I mean, I get. I get like you can't demand or you know special considerations without also taking discipline um, to to give pride a place to one's own opinions. That's to be fair. That is democratic socialism going back to the Second International. It's like okay, like even if you disagree, if it's voted on and we all agree to it, you're bound right. by it because sure. you voted on it and you lost. But you did have a chance to to persuade uh, the rest of the collective. So there you go. Right, right. Um, totally reasonable. But I can also see, and like Mao, people talk about Trotsky splits, but I've done histories. Maoist splits are not in China. Uh -huh. right? So that's important to point out. Well, but, you know why. but in places where the, where Maoist parties are not in power, which is to say everywhere that's not China, um, it's just an interesting thing to think about. Like Maoist parties can't guess came into power in Nepal, and there have been coalitional governments run by Maoists, but like they've not. There has not been like a a second Mao revolution that was that was based off of Marxist Leninist Mao Zedong thought as the Marxist Leninist Maoism Maoism that won. That's interesting. Oh, but have there been Maoist parties like full stop abroad? Yeah, there's plenty. Okay. Uh, the, okay. There's like there's like some in some countries there's bunches <laughs> of them. Because um, that, and you, they've you split. mentioned Hosha earlier, and that you know. Hoja's not Maoist well. though at all. No, but he, you know, it's also about one country and it's sort of right. applicable locally. And yet there are, yeah, yeah, you know, there are versions Hojas, of that abroad. But there are Hojas abroad. The thing about Hoja is Hoja basically says Mao is revisionist to Stalin. Like if you actually read these texts, these do not sure. support. And and I hate to like agree with Hoja on something because mm -hmm. I mean the way he ran Albania is insane. Yeah. But um. He's not entirely wrong that if you actually read Maoist doctrine and at least actually oddly until until um, you have to specifically read late Stalin. So Stalin in 1951 okay. and Dung for it to be even kind of compatible hmm. and you can't read early Stalin. So the Stalin of like the 30s um, or, or God forbid the Stalin before the head of the Soviet Union. Um, nor can you read, um, uh, Maoism in something like the sixties and seventies and really make it work. Like there are massive differences. Um, and that's why, you know, that's like one of the reasons why a lot of like Marxist Leninists who are also done us today really want to make the fifties through the mid seventies in China kind of go away. Mm -hmm. And they want to make the Sino-Soviet split like Khrushchev bad, Gorby bad. We're not talking about anything in between. We're not, you know, um, and we're not talking about the fact that like, oh, the United States also helped China with Cambodia and the Khmer. Like, we're not talking about any of that. Like, 
keep your mouth shut, shut up. We're not going to talk about China like being nice to Pinochet just to piss off the Soviets. We're not going to talk about any of that. Um, so keep your fucking mouth shut about it. But, but uh, during this time, you know, Ho just kind of got a point about how, like, this is different. Um, the, however, although God forbid you're revisionist to Stalin, who was, you know, probably revisionist to Marx, well, what, I mean, re Lenin. revision. So, what's interesting about the revisionism controversy mm -hmm. is it's um, it's a it's it's basically a name taken from the debate within the Second International applied mm -hmm. to the Third. Yeah, but it has no real relationship to the first revisionism controversy. The okay. second revisionism controversy is: Do you think we should critique Stalin? Yes, no. Yeah. Um, okay. that's it. That's the only thing at stake in the second revisionism controversy. Um, and you know, also by that point, social democrats—they're out. They're not involved at all. Uh, the the left oppositionists—they're out. They're not involved at all. Mm -hmm. The left communists, they're out. They're not involved at all. This is an inter-Marxist-Leninist fight. Right. Um, and it's interesting because when you're asking, well, what's what's being revised? And people are like, shut up. Because they're also, like, during the same time period, what's interesting about Maoist in particular, but, but in general, you start hearing about new synthesis. It's like, oh, well, Marx was wrong about stuff. Yeah. What's interesting is now you don't get that from these same people. They're like, no, no, we're 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 the real Marxist and we're not revising anything. Look at these five quotes from the Grunjessa and the critique of the Gertha program that sound sure. like they 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 make our point, even though you have to ignore everything around them to believe it. I um, had to start somewhere. <laughs> uh, but but I actually admire in some ways, the honesty of Marxist Leninists from the 50s and 60s are like, no, we're revising shit because we have to, but that's not the revision that matters. Sure. The revision that matters are do whether or not you sided with Stalin. Uh, and the reason why they think that matters, it, in some cases, is like, well, Stalin didn't do it. and But the other cases is like, well, you're going to make the entire world socialist movement look bad and stupid. Mm. Um, but then again, that kind of puts you in a conundrum because if you actually believe Stalin did this, then think about what this says. What should you do? <laughs> like, Correct. I don't know. Like th this, th this does get you into conundrum if you like try to take it like seriously. All right, back to this. All right, number five. This is going to be the longest podcast on what is essentially <laughs> like twenty sentences. But this uh, is, someone <laughs> had to do it. Come on. Um. All right. Uh, we are on five to indulge in personal attacks, pick Carl's vent personal spite or seek revenge instead of entering into an argument and struggling. This is where struggle sessions come from against incorrect views for the sake of unity or progress or getting work done properly. This is the fifth type. This is basically do everything through former channels again. Um, but you have a duty to do it if you disagree. And if you bring up your thing and lose, you have a duty to go with the collective. All right. Um, to hear incorrect views without rebutting them or to even hear counter-revolutionary remarks without reporting them, but instead to take them calmly as if nothing happened. This is the sixth type. This is the, I like to call it the snitch clause. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> so. it, it's got the snitch clause, but that's exactly why I wrote here that it like, it rings of points one and three, which are also like the preambulatory snitch clauses. Um, they're, they're the principled get... snitz clause as opposed to this, which is just like, if you hear counter-revolutionary remarks, and we're not going to define what that is in this paragraph, by the way, no. um, report them. <laughs> if you see something, say something. Yeah, but the, right. this one is interesting because it's more like impugning the personality or mood even of the, the person who he hears, like implications of some sort of laziness or carelessness on their part, you know, your responsibility is to do something about it. But like, yeah, it's not, it's, I, it's not my a... question is how do you differentiate between what like motivates and how are these really different? They part don't care. Three, That's not, question. you're asking too many <laughs> fucking questions. Obviously, <laughs> I would not, not be welcome Chinese. in this You're not a good Chinese comment. I thought you said I'm supposed to speak. Come on now, <laughs> guys. All right. Uh, we voted against you. Although there's only <laughs> two of us, so. Um. <laughs> 
Uh, uh, anyway, uh, we're tired the, of struggling with this one. Yeah. Well, I mean, part of the problem that I think with this is like, I, it, I, I like that you're taking this logically seriously. I'm reminding myself that these are like, this is basically the communist version of like a truth speech or an HR speech. <laughs> like, Okay. Like, like that's what I think is actually going on here. Yeah, yeah. It's like don't don't gossip. Bring your stuff through formal channels. Snitch on snitch snitch on yeah. bitches. And um which, you know, I don't it really depends on the stakes here. Uh-huh. Uh but then there are some things where like correct and incorrect views i'm like okay but how, you're not giving us actual guidelines here on what they are except right. maybe that's what the party all agrees on but like there's not there's not guidelines here as to what to deal with a um ambiguous remark or something where if you're not what, is it reactionary or not i don't know right like and i i do think that like a lot of anti-communist propaganda makes good use of this text for this reason mm -hmm. because it does sound like well, i mean it sounds like well this is how you operate an in inquisition um, and I, I don't think that's actually everything that's going on here, but I, I it get... isn't, but there has to be like, there is a certainly a baseline of this is confusing a little, you know, here are a bunch of rules to follow and don't just think like you're the one following this. Everyone next to you is following this too. So it's making you think about how you speak and behave in every right. situation, which is good, mm -hmm. but like, it's, it's one of these things where like, okay. All these principles in context could be good, but I also, every one of them, I'm like, I can see this going out of hand real fast. And we, unfortunately, particularly uh, in the case of, like, Maoist sectarian groups outside of China, we have plenty of evidence of it going out of control yeah, real yeah. fast. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not... You, you can't not deal with all the weird 70s and 60s, like what looked like Maoist depth cults from outside. Sure. <laughs> like, um, anyway. Uh, seven. Seven. To be among the masses and the fail to conduct propaganda or agitation or to speak at meetings and conduct or conduct investigations and inquiries among them, uh, do workers inquiry and spread our position at all times. Instead, to be indifferent to them and show no concern for their well-being, forgetting that one is a communist and behaving as if one were an ordinary non-communist. This is the seventh type. What's interesting is, is like this is also like you, you do this not because you're trying to like just spread communism, but because you actually think this is going to help people. Right. Um, Which is certainly noble. And yeah, I guess but I also think that's what mass... you like Christians say too. About right, like, there is version. there definitely there's an element of proselytizing here, and you know, you, you if you've ever had that that particular friend who's like, ah, great, we have 15 people, I'm going to start spreading the good word, you know, that kind of sucks. But what, yeah, what is a mass here would be just like in a public space as opposed it, to not just it, in it, a it, party in meeting a public or... space in a, so I guess it means public space in some kind of political capacity, like. Mm. But I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. Like because, because I don't know. Were they having like you know, municipal town hall meetings outside of? Yes, they were. And also, yeah. there's a lot of organization. Me also like these are broken down communities that are fighting in wars that have been fighting sure. in wars for like forty fucking years at this point. Okay, I guess that makes a lot more sense than just going into like the city square and being like. Hear ye, hear ye. All right. Yeah, I mean, you're going into a city square that's like likely been bombed by imperialist powers, a couple of warlords, and like, you know, and there's been massive strikes, and these people have in this place, and these people have in that place, and there's massive like that's the context where where I think we like your your description of this sounds like well, this is what the students would do with it in the 60s, right? Right, right, right. But right. that's not what's going on. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, I have actually dealt with this, like, where, where you have what I like to call the, the communist church contingent, and they usually mouse, uh, who are like, have you heard of the, the good news of the primary contradiction? Yeah. And we are not getting into that because that's not in here, but that's, that's another thing that's unique to Maoism. That's really um, interesting. You know. So. I just feel bad for, like, 
a really, you know, seriously convicted and well-meaning Maoist communist in China who has like zero self-confidence or doesn't like speaking publicly and like, you know, they're seen outside somewhere and they didn't spread the good news. And one of their comrades pulled some aside and said like, Hey, you really missed an opportunity there. Like, didn't you read what being a liberal point number seven is? Well, so <laughs> you're laughing at this, but this got people killed in Peru. I, that's like, it's really sad because this, there's just different, so they would people. send like women into rural villages to uh like this is Galonzo and the Shining Path, uh to okay. convert them to to uh to the movement and they would condemn the elders and then the elders would kill the woman who did it. Um and then uh, there would be reprisals. And what was interesting about this is this is something that if you actually look at what what the communist in China did, they never actually did that. They would go in and like, they would actually pay pretty like some deferential to like, as long as they weren't bourgeois, like local power authorities, and then like try to coax them into more egalitarian relations of gender. I mean, that was a big propaganda campaign for the Maoists. I mean, they were actually in some ways bigger than that, than like the, the, the Soviets after the, huh. after the twenties. Okay. But, uh, but, uh, not to say the Soviets totally gave up on feminism either, but there, like, there is a sense that during um, during the war there was a retreat from from uh, you know non normative gender relations, right? Sure. Uh, and Maoism uh, tends to be tends to take a Stalinist principle against like homosexuality and all this is bourgeois de deviation that becomes a problem for a long time. Um, Is that why I have question I've had questions for a while about why certain groups now which are you know based on gender specific or you know gender not specific even sexual um rights are are self-avowed maoists in our day and age with this kind of an understanding of what that actually means you know it's it's weird there have been reforms um both uh i mean in china itself now uh and and in like the RCP in the United States and a lot of historical um, Maoist parties to modernize their gender norms. Interesting. Um, uh, okay. But um, they are his. There, it's kind of uneven, um, and there's still a lingering like. Uh, homosexuality is the Pete bourgeois deviationism, and that that goes back to Stalin. Uh, and that is a reversal from like when and yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I don't think it's, there's not, again, I sound like I'm an apologist, but there's not an easy guide here, but some of the stuff they did in the, uh, particularly in the, in the sixties and seventies was not great. Um, and liberalism on these points in the in the cultural sense of being more tolerant uh has come late to china and um it's come late to a lot of other areas too sure. um it was something that like when i taught chinese students actually one of the things that they said that the united states changed their opinion about was very little not about communism at all um even though a lot of these chinese students were rich which is kind of funny but um, it was that they they felt like that China needed to modernize its attitude towards homosexuality uh, in a slow way and not like do it all at once and not, you know, big gay communist future. But that they actually which interesting to me because there were some Stalinists to be like, well, China doesn't still have that problem. That's totally made up. And I'm like, well, I've talked to Chinese people. Yeah, uh, I don't know how uh, you get to make that call from that. Outside. Um, but there have been a lot of like modernizations. There's also factions of the CPC um, in the leadership that are afraid of Western decadence, and they associate with it. So they, it's it's a debate within the CPC itself. Sure, um, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, but during this time period, you're gonna they're gonna take Stalin's line on, on that kind of stuff, and. But it's interesting because they did push like female equality. I mean, Mao pushed it, even though there was a lot of feminists and some of the people who got caught up in in the in all rounds of these purges and the rightist campaign 
in the Cultural Revolution and in the and the rectification campaigns in the 40s were like what we would call um, female advocates or socialist feminists or Marxist hmm. feminists uh, within okay. the movement. So th right. that did happen. I've heard but of that. there was a big, it was, it was a bigger ma uh, mal talking point than it was probably in the USSR in the 50s and 60s. Um, Interesting. The part of the thing we have to remember that was like gender norms for certain areas uh, in China were futile are yeah. worse so like um it's th there was more to deal with i mean and, and that's and even... you also had like um you know male courtesans and things of that nature well the, the, one of the things that mal tries to do actually was get rid of uh was get rid of sex work without mm -hmm. without killing anyone so like that's the whole idea of brainwashing were these re-education camps for like Lump and proletariat, and what he would call non hostile, what in Maoism was deemed non hostile classes. So, sex workers, former brigands, and stuff, people who would work with the state and take work if they could get it, like, but who weren't necessarily like what you know, lump and bourgeoisie or whatever. But, um, that actually makes more sense. And certain groups that I, I, I know who are now, uh, Maoist actually, mm -hmm. as sex workers, former sex workers, yeah. Okay. Um, whereas uh, the kind of socialist stance on sex work was utterly incoherent. It still um, is. Right. <laughs> like, funny. it's just all over the place. Like, yeah, yeah. Whereas Mao, Mao had a, I mean, I hate to use Christian parlance. I feel like I use, with Maoism, I use Christian parlance a lot more. And I think it's partly That's because of the focus on the masses. And there's such a focus on uh, ideological unity. Sure. Um, but where and, I'm like. And here, you know, the proselytizing again. Yeah, Mao had a big thing on like hate the sinner, not this. I mean, hate the sin, not the sinner, in regards to like sex work and lumpenness and stuff like that. Like he'd be like, "Okay, if you get out, we don't care." Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You know, as opposed to like the Lenin comment, "Go shoot the sex workers," which they didn't actually do, by the way. I I, I read that and I did not know that they didn't deliver on the oh, that it may have even been a bad joke on on Lenin's part, but uh, <sighs> it was not a general principle to shoot sex workers. Could but you know. um but that uh Mao had really did have like this whole non-aligned classes rehabilitation thing um that was and that's the origins of the idea of brainwashing actually um but that doesn't the, those kind of like uh you know worker education camps and whatnot that really is a product of the 50s Right. Um, okay. That's, that's not happening yet, but that's kind of where it comes from. All right. The other only like interesting point that I would make about this um, last one that we read is that here Mao seems to be acquainting, like equating rather all non-communism, all non-communists with liberalism. Yeah, he does. Like there's an even bigger, <laughs> broader sweep of the brush in this one, but that's fine. Like, don't behave like a non-communist. That's just liberalism. This is why when Marxist Leninists call people liberals, you have no idea what the fuck they mean. Yeah, yeah. Because like sometimes they might be calling like there have been people calling each other liberals, both of whom are Marxist Leninists, by the way, for holding opposite opinions. Amazing. Like, so it's like, you know, you're a liberal because you oppose sex work. You're a liberal because you're for sex work. Sure, sure. Like you're a liberal because, um. I mean, it, it gets absurd, actually, but, uh, and that's why I do think after, you know, and then you left, um, liberal was just a swear. Yeah. And then it went away. It was then a swear for conservatives. And then it came back, uh, after 2008, 2009 as a swear again. Mm-hmm. And I remember because I participated in using it as a swear because uh, in like when I was like 27, I'd be like, I'd be like playing love me. I'm a liberal. And but I have I have in some ways recanted yeah. re recanted of that because I don't think even though I think for one thing, for example, liberalism is the bedrock of most of Western civilization in a bad way. Right. But um. I don't know what people mean by it when they use it now. Like it means e everything we think is bad can be called liberal. And 
and you don't see that in Lenin. You don't even see that in Stalin, but you do see it in Mao. Mm -hmm. And I think it's maybe a difference of audience. Like, again, Mao is, is dealing with peasants. He's educating in a language that's very difficult. Um, whereas a lot of our, our documents from, like, the Bolsheviks, we're not reading like the public propaganda speeches we're reading the internal documents are like are like textbook justification pieces or stuff like that and i think that's a big difference in like what we get here and i also think we do have to deal with the difference in language yes um uh, always which is not to say that like China some like backwards ass language that you can't have prose in because it's absolutely not no question. but that's not what this is aimed at and so it is I do sometimes like try to put that in context when I'm like, why do why does this stuff seem so problematic in like Maoist groups outside of China, but not as problematic in actual China? And sometimes I'm like, is it language? I don't know. Yeah. Chinese speakers, tell me. I got some who like listen to my show. Can you tell me if it's like how does this read in Mandarin? Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> Interesting. Okay. All right. Anyway, because uh, I really, uh, I, I'm like German. I have no idea what this is in its original language. Okay. So, all right. Uh, back to the principles. I, yeah. Although I, I don't see how anything's going to get out of the accusation that this is like conflating what are, what, other than individualism, I don't see how any of this is classed at all. Like, so, not really so far, except, well, well the later ones that we're coming up to um yeah we kind of mentions work then it starts to make a little bit more yeah. sense but to be among the mass okay we already did that <laughs> um to see someone harming the interest of the masses and not feel and and yet not feel indignant or to dissuade or stop him on reason with them but allow him to continue this is the ave type so you see someone doing bad shit you don't try to stop it uh god this this does feel christian Sure, that feels well, very hey. Christian, and it also certainly doesn't describe a modern-day American conception of liberalism. You know? No, it has like like nothing to do with it at all. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, when I say it feels Christian, I mean like that injunction to like, well, you have to stop it in all cases, like because you know what you know what you don't hear. I don't hear that in almost any other kinds of Marxist texts. Like, if, can you can you think of a Marxist text, even a practical one? that was written in like Russia or Germany or France that has that no. kind of thing in it. I and can't it doesn't one. square to, with my understanding of like a Slavic or Russian ethos in any way, shape or form. No. Uh, <laughs> Sorry guys. <laughs> or, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I think this is a good principle. Like, Absolutely. okay. Like, because notice here, it's not even just fight him. It's like dissuade him or stop him or at least at least try to reason with try him. Like, to, like, yeah, yeah. It's not a bad principle, but it is sort of like it. It is so individual on in its framing, both in what you're trying to stop and who's doing the action. Yeah, yeah. You it's know, very you, what would Jesus do? 100. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Um, to work half-heartedly without a definite plan or direction. To work uh, perfunctorily or muddle along. So long as one remains a monk and one goes on toiling the bell, this is a knife type. I do love that there's a little dig at Buddhist monks in here. That's um, uh, Catholic monks have bells too, but I guess. Maybe <laughs> that's a reference, but I think this is Buddhist, honestly. It makes um, a lot more sense as Buddhism. Yeah. No, this uh, one this one makes a, a bit more sense as well. And certainly when you are, you know, Coiling within the collective and you're supposed to subjugate yourself to, you know, the, mm. the will of the masses and for their betterment, you better work your ass off and have some understanding of what you're doing. Yeah. It makes sense if you're like working on, um, you know, uh, the factory floor in some industrial setting or all you do is this one movement over and over again, pressing a button that you don't give a shit, but that's not what's supposed to be happening. I mean, and you know, I'm province. So these people are also basically in internal exile and they're under war conditions and hiding and have to grow their own food. So like, right. like, uh, they can't really easily get stuff. It yeah. like, like I do kind of like to like, <laughs> I think I would say this too, if we're all like, look, we got to grow shit. We're yeah. going to starve. 
Like, come on. We can't have... Don't do shit half-heartedly right now. We need more people to our cause, and we need to fucking have food. Chop, right. chop. I mean, I, I even know personally um, old stories from, like, kibbutzim in the early days of Israel that were, like, super hardcore socialists and would roll, sorry, would, would throw members out for, you know, rolling cigarettes during work time and things of that nature. So Yeah, I mean, they're even more hardcore than your boss. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. But uh, And that's a lot more people to please as well. <laughs> Just one yeah. who, you know, who's only looking over... Everyone's All of a sudden, Jordan becomes a liberal and becomes a girl boss. No, thank um, you. Hashtag no. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> All right. Girl boss. <laughs> yes. Right. Um, I'm just just saying, like, if someone stopped you from rolling your cigarettes, then that would probably be like, no, I'm a reactionary now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Happily self-employed. Yeah, there you go. Um. No, to regard oneself as rendering great service to the revolution, to pride oneself on being a veteran, to disdain minor uh, assignments while being quite unequal to major tasks, to be slipshod in work and slack and study. This is a Tim Snipe. So, like, don't be a don't be an asshole just because you did something in the past. Uh, again, great personal advice. Have no idea what it has to do with liberalism. Sure, you're not above menial tasks just because you did this thing. Like, yeah. And again, there there is like something about, um, I guess a certain like milieu and strata class wise within like a liberal society that looks down upon certain kinds of work or they think of themselves as superior because they have a degree or they're a CEO or whatever. But like, right. that's such a modern conception and it has nothing to do with anything back then other than individualism. Yeah. So, so the, the individual, but like, it's not like they weren't in medieval times telling people like, Hey, just because you did this one thing doesn't mean you like get to Lord over everybody forever. Sure. You got responsibilities, even if you're a Lord and get to Lord over people <laughs> like, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I guess one of the things I like, uh, you know, one of the few things that I really defend about Maoism that's often controversial is I actually defend the practice of restification, not because it, because it's always presented as a punishment mm. for the, for, for urban elite workers. And it may have been partially that, but part of its aim was to take the skills and stuff that were available at high levels of population concentration in the city and diffuse them throughout society. Sure. And, and this is the just, this line is one of the justifications for that. Like, look, you got, you like, yes, you've done great things, but now you got to go and work like everybody else and share your great thing for everybody. You don't get just to rest on your laurels because you did one thing once. A hundred percent. And that one good thing that you did or your heroism or veteran, you know, whatever, <clears throat> isn't going to help you if you come into a situation where now you need to grow potatoes or whatever to, to live. Right. So. And, you know, again, to put it out, like they are growing rice to live in Yunnan province. So it's like, but, but in another serious sense, like this is something of the things that, that, that we talked about tendencies in Maoism, this is a tendency of Maoism that I generally think is good and is often lacking mm -hmm. in other tendencies in socialism. Uh, and that's, you know, despite the fact that I've indicated, I think some of these principles when taken out of context lead to insanity. I think this one's actually really wise. Sure. Like, just because you did something once doesn't mean that you can stop doing shit and we're all equal. Yes, you did that great thing, but you still have other stuff to do. And uh, we're not we're not taking that away from you, but we're also not giving you any special privileges either. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it is a fair handed manner. Okay. All right. To be aware of one's own mistakes and yet make no attempt to, to correct them, this is to take a liberal attitude towards yourself. This is the 11th type. Now, on one hand, I love this principle. On the other hand, I have no fucking idea what it has to do with liberalism again. <laughs> like, yeah. like, I'm like, okay, so to not own your mistakes uh, or, or to know your mistakes but not try to fix them. Okay, so you... Yeah, so you're not self like you, you might self criticize, but you're not self correcting. Okay, Mike, who cares then? But again, and, and I hate to say this, all this feels like stuff I'd hear in church, not stuff I'd hear at a Marxist meeting. Maybe I right. shouldn't hear at a Marxist meeting. I don't know, but <laughs> but still, or in know. a classroom, or just whatever at the dinner table with your yeah. Family like I've something. said this as a teacher, but yeah, like... exactly. No, my note on this one was 
liberal attitude in what sense tolerant self-accepting <laughs> just like can't yeah. really but um yeah again you know he ends with a banger with that one but um, yeah that we could it. name more but these are these are these 11 are the principal types and i do think your your thing about oh well this sounds like buddhism or confucianism or whatever i think it sounds like not super literate culture number like if you're not doing poetry even when you i mean because he's basically saying we have these are 11 are the principal types of liberals really they're more but i needed a list and i said 11 so you got it sure so and that, in that list i mean you could also probably easily um you know boil these down to six or seven if we wanted yeah, to some of them are kind of redundant <laughs> exactly <laughs> But whatever, we'll stick with 11. I right. like the whole, like, you know, there's more than this, but we got these ones. So now we actually get to the justification for this. Mm -hmm. All right. They are all manifestations of liberalism. I don't know. They're manifestations of highly individualistic behavior, which I, which I would say is ideologically justified in liberalism. And in that very weak sense, I can kind of make it work. But, but it's uh, not, can we also say probably not only just in liberalism? No, because like these are problems that you hear people talking about in the second century, which it's like, like none of these problems are unique to capitalism, like at all. Um, and so how can they be unique to liberalism of which capitalism is a political economic mode? Again, except for maybe like the lazy worker who's just doing some rote, you know. No, but that's an, even that. Like, you've never heard of a lazy fucking peasant in a feudal, in a, like a feudal or Islamic hate <laughs> society. Like, come I on. I assume that existed as well. Yeah, like, yeah, like that's not. There's nothing here that's actually unique to to capitalism, right? Which means that it can't be unique to liberalism in in the sense that Marxists tend to use it. Agreed. Now, you know. Maybe it's because we think of like liberalism as just being broad minded or whatever, and we need to be narrowly focused revolutionaries. But I'm not sure that that would, you know, that that that's. I've been told that this this word does mean what I think it means. Like it's tied to this word in Mandarin is the word that we would associate with like political, economic, Western liberalism, right? Not just in like cosmopolitan tolerance or whatever. Um, and even that, even this doesn't, oh, some of these don't apply to cosmopolitan intolerance either. I mean, like oh, it's yeah. it, I, the best I can figure out what is going on here is propagating liberalism bad. Here are bad things. We're calling them liberal because that's what the word we're using and, for bad. Yeah. And here's a way that we can, um, unify conceptions about our enemies. As right. Well, yeah. Where they aren't similar. Okay. Right. So as like very vulgar propaganda, I see how this works. But this sure. is this is vulgar propaganda. There's no Absolutely. like to me, there's no way around that. The pamphletiest uh, of pamphlets. Yeah. I mean, and it's so pamphletity that like even though this is quoted all the time, I think one of the reasons it's quoted is people don't actually read it. Which is a pity because <laughs> it doesn't have to take two hours, guys. It would take right. twelve minutes. Um, okay. I mean be also because like combat liberalism sounds cooler than like Hey, don't be a jerk. Right. <laughs> like, that's what I also like that that I thought like combat liberalism was going to be like a militant type of liberalism and not like a directive. Like, no, you have to combat liberalism. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> combat liberalism. No, yeah. I, I've made that joke before. Um, of course, it begs it. I've uh, actually talked about people who say combat liberalism are often guilty of combat liberalism, which is just like, which is like meta shit liberty. Oh, Lord. Um, anyway, uh, and you you will <laughs> notice that I don't generally use the term shit lib because I find it obnoxious. I used to use the term rad lib to separate from classical liberals, but even that kind of got nah, yeah. annoying. Um, now we can just be specific because we have words. words. For things. <laughs> um, liberalism is extremely harmful in a revolutionary collective. I mean, so here's the thing. Both the things he described and I also think classically instituted liberalism as understood by the enlightenment are both that statement is true for both. Um, but anyway, um, it is corrosive, 
it's it's a corrosive which eats the way at unity undermines cohesion causes apathy and creates dissension sure i mean i think that's true for both things and i'm saying both things because the things described up there are not necessarily liberal Yes. It robs the revolutionary uh, ranks of compact organization and strict discipline, prevents policies from being carried through, and alienates the party organization from the masses which the party leads. It is an extremely bad tendency. So here, like, yeah, dissent seems reasonable in a number of situations when it isn't apathetic, right? Just judging on... As long as you do it through former channels and in the right ways. Right. And then the other thought that I have after that is like, I wonder what liberal tendencies in a post-revolutionary moment are more acceptable, if at all, or once, you know, revolution is achieved and crystallized, are these elements of liberalism less of a threat? Like, or is every moment just revolutionary for now? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe because it would make sense to use this as like an eternal boogie monster obviously like there's no space for any of this at any point in time but here I mean because you need to maintain unity within the party for things to last I assume but if the reason behind it all is because it's anti-revolutionary what happens once the revolution is over and you won yeah, I, uh, I, I, I don't know. Like this is not given that context. Um, right. So it's 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 a like one thing I will say is I have seen this criticized even from Marxist Leninist as being confused, and that is basically moralizing. Um, that. That this is about individual behavior in and in a group collective and thus uh, doesn't truly deal with um, the class and social context except by a gloss at the end, which is a real stretch. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of am sympathetic to that critique of this particular um, I, essay. I came to a pretty similar conclusion, yeah. It's like, this, like these are kind of okay principles, I guess, like, I guess but they, there's... Like, I don't know really what it has to do with liberalism, except that we agree that liberalism is bad. So right. all these bad things uh, in a very, like, broad way are individualistic. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they're bad. Although, yeah, it's not. You know, it's it's not. Well, let's something... read more because I think that flushes out even more in the next, like, two paragraphs. The moralizing. Yeah, so so let's uh, get into. Um, uh, uh, liberalism yeah. stems from petty bourgeois selfishness. Yeah. It places personal I'm, interest actually, first. What's that? Go ahead. I'm making sure. That's where we stopped, right? Yeah, liberalism yeah, stems from petty bourgeois selfishness. It places personal interest first, and the interest of the revolution second. And this gives rise to ideological, political, and organizational liberalism. That's pretty like straightforward. People who so, are liberals. Oh, go ahead. No, go finish the statement, and then I'll talk about what I think might be going on there that's more justifiable in a particular context. Go ahead, it, because I mean, that was one paragraph. <laughs> all right. So <laughs> what I almost... think maybe maybe going on there is what forms of liberalism are in place in China? So you got comprador bourgeoisie who are siding, who are like betraying their people and siding with uh, colonial powers. And you have like large peasant holders. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in the sense that like, you know, not just in like the abstract sense of like liberalism is about methodological individualism, blah, blah, blah. But in a very strict sense of like, well, who do they know? Who who are people in Yan'an in 1937 or 1942 going to know as um, non-foreign, non-colonial liberal capitalist? It's probably yeah. only going to be like local self-interested petite bourgeois. And in that sense, mm -hmm. I see what he's talking about. Sure, like. But it's a really terrible class analysis, like historically, because it's not true. 
that liberalism really came out of uh, petite bourgeois interest at all. No. And if anything, the, you know, people who would, who would say like, okay, like fascism is liberalism and in, in crisis or whatever, which I think is both superficially true, but doesn't actually say that much. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, if you read like the Brumaire and whatnot, it's not clear that what's being referred here to liberalism is at all what we think would be the formal uh, development of a petty bourgeois consciousness. Like that's like Bonapartism or or Hitlerism or whatever. Like, there's a lot of things we might link to it, but not just being selfish and lazy. <laughs> like, sure. Um, you know. So I, I, I get like the appeal here and I can see in the Chinese context, if I'm really thinking about it hard, why this may be that kind of the image of the petite bourgeois from a Chinese perspective in Yunnan in 1937. Yeah. But like, uh, it's highly localized and entirely ahistorical. Yeah. This is totally historical. Like there's yeah. no, there, there's, it's so historical that it's hard to say, it's hard to see how it would be like why anyone would quote this. Like the, other than its title, it's like, why would you bring this up? Because this is just, you know, a few and principles. The, and the normative and the moralizing elements are trans historical. It seems to just be descriptors of types of people you don't want to work or organize with. Right. And, and, and absolutely you don't want to deal with these kinds of people, but mm-hmm. like, like what that the, the, there's they they aren't types limited to liberalism at all or no. even to the petite bourgeois. Sure. Um, yeah, okay. <clears throat> Pe- people who are liberals look upon the principles of Marxism as an abstract dogma. Ah, yes, you purity fetish people. They approve of Marxism but are not prepared to practice it or to practice it in full. They are not prepared to replace their liberalism by Marxism. And I, I think it's interesting that in this translation, liberalism is not capitalized and Marxism is capitalized. Sure. Uh, which, which I find it's just in- an adjective, and it's not like a pro- proper adjective in this case. Right. Which, yeah. which I'm like, I'm not even sure that would come across in Chinese, but it means um, something to us. Yes. It means something to us, and I wonder if like there's an indication in the Chinese that would make you translate it that way. Interesting. Um, interesting. I'm always interested in the editorial choices and in, in so many things because. There are whole misunderstandings in English that come from editors. A hundred percent. These people have their Marxism, but they have their liberalism as well. They talk Marxism, but 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 practice liberalism. They apply Marxism to others, but liberalism to themselves. They keep both kinds of goods in stock and will find use for each. This is how the minds of certain people work. Liberalism is a manifestation. Highly psychological, you know, like just i'm judgmental yeah yeah I mean, this is how it, certain people's minds work right they're liberal people yeah. right liberalism is a manifestation of opportunism and conflicts fundamentally with marxism it is negative and objectively has the the effect of helping the enemy that is why the enemy welcomes its preservation in our midst such being its nature which also implies that the liberals a the commandant are not actually liberals by this standard because they only wanted an armits, but not on their own. Sure, right. Which I find strange as well. There is an implication that the the enemy or the foe, whatever, doesn't want liberalism within their midst, but only right. within the other side. But will encourage it in the other side. Which I'm thinking is like, okay, so liberalism is not an ideology of your enemy. It's like a vice that your enemy encourages, but doesn't actually have. Like that's the reading of that text right there. Like, yeah, the, the, yeah. I don't know how to read that implication otherwise. I I'm with you. And my other question is like, what, what's the difference between personal opportunism and like political or ideological sort of, yeah, there's uh, in this, there isn't any, right. Like there absolutely is no distinction. Because Um, that's liberalism. (laughs) I'm just going to keep using that line. I'm kidding. Such being its nature, there should be no place for, for it in the ranks of revolution. We must use Marxism, which is positive in spirit, to overcome liberalism, which is negative. This is this is the kind of stuff that I and that I often accuse of reading like Taoist folk magic. Uh, 
Like it's like so X principle is positive, this principle is negative. This is very easily understandable. One principle is in the other, blah blah blah. And like yes, in a very like vulgar sense, it's kind of what dialectics is about, but like no, it's absolutely not what like any of the people would have recognized as dialectics, including I would I would to, to to like combat this idea that this is just an orientalist problem, mm -hmm. including most like communist intellectuals in China, I right. assume. Like but that doesn't sound dialectical. You know what I mean? There doesn't sound like there's elements of good and bad yeah. in the other. A communist should have the largeness of mind and should be staunch and active, looking upon the interests of the revolution in his very life and subordinating his personal interests to those of the revolution, always and everywhere. You should adhere to the principle and wage a tireless struggle against all incorrect ideas and actions as to consolidate the collective life of the party and to strengthen the ties between the party and the masses. He should be more concerned about the party and the masses than about any private person and more concerned ab about others than about himself. So Only... this is like, oh, sorry. Yeah, Go there's ahead. a sentence. <laughs> Only thus can he be considered a communist. Now, here I think is the most direct and directive description of what a communist is and should do and how they should behave in favor of the masses and, and revolution and you know all of that. Funny about that. And it, it's what's missing from here is any description of liberalism. Yeah. Or any description of class at also. all. Absolutely. Well, that's, this is a Marxist. That's more important than a description of liberalism, isn't it? Certainly. Yes. Yeah, exactly. The only thing where we see liberalism here is in the beginning, which is that, you know, it needs to be, overcome because it's negative and marxism is good so, but everything else that has to do with it is revolutionary and political and it isn't particular to marxism so i'm going to say this and this is going to be hyper controversial uh -oh. um and this is not true of most maoist writings but this could have come out of if you just said if you just changed a fascist should from a communist should it would absolutely still be coherent i was just thinking the same thing absolutely like because the concern with the masses as opposed to uh as opposed to the class as opposed you know like all right. this stuff um incorrect ideas right right because it's not mm -hmm. defined and it's because it's vague this is not because this is inherently fascistic it's so vague that you could use it for anything though that's like, the point that sh people yeah that's my point they here. turn you to the yeah before like oh you're saying mao is the same as hitler no i'm not no, absolutely not this particular um, paragraph is vague enough and devoid of class critique or analysis of any kind that it can be used in a number of ways. And I not just fascism, but particularly it's any nationalism. kind of nationalism can use it too. Exactly. Like, like, and that I do think is actually more substantive of a critique that the focus on the national masses. That's why I brought up the stuff about uh, national proletarianism. And I, again, the only other people who talked about proletarian nations, which uh, I believe is Enrico Cardini mm -hmm. and the National Syndicalist Movement, they became fascist. Right. That was like Mussolini. That was the word Mussolini used all the time for Italy. Sure. I mean, the Comentan could have, you know, yeah, they used it appropriated too. this as well. They did use it. Oh, like, wonderful. So, you know, like, now that's. And there's a there's there's a debate on how much that's still in Mao by the time you get to um, the 50s where Mao is actually running a country. Um, but there is one of the things I find interesting and I tell this story a lot, but it was a Maoist who told me this. Uh, a Maoist, a Maoist friend of mine. Now, this was not a Dungus Maoist. This is the old kind of Maoist, the, you know, the Cultural Revolution Maoist. Uh, the 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 Marxist internationalist, no Marxist uh, Leninist Maoist kind of Maoist as opposed to Marxist internationalist Maoist. Um, and one day I will do a video explaining all those differences in detail. But um, uh, he told me that national Bolshevism is really easy to justify with Maoist rhetoric, and it's a problem in Maoist communities. And it's often not recognized by other leftists because they only recognize it when it's white. Interesting. And it was a this was a Latin American Maoist of color who told me this. Like this is not an outsider who's hostile to Maoism, but he was like, "That's our deviation." Um, and uh, 
you can see why and, and stuff like this. I think you can see why if this is the part of Maoism you're attracted to. Now, we've talked about where we could see these like going wrong as principles. And I've talked like hinted at like, you know, various Maoist groups who probably took some of these things into the extreme. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I mentioned Shining Path, I've mentioned certain uh Japanese Maoist, etc. Um I want to point out that that's not really what happened historically. I mean, like, again, while there were purges and some of them were violent, we don't have like it wasn't like a constant mass uh removal of large portions of the population. Um so it's uh, it's not, it, it's, it is not the same kind of thing. I think it's interesting to me when I, when, when I, when I see this as being dangerous, it's like, okay, well, this is moralistic. And then you can apply it out of context in ways that are disastrous, particularly if you're not reading a whole lot of other Mao and you don't know the rest of, of the doctrines sure. that may develop this out. And it's also going to lead you to just use liberalism in a way that's like utterly meaningless to it other than a floating signifier for bad. Which is, um, yeah, that's something we don't need. <laughs> frankly, anymore. It's super of. common on the yeah. left. Um, and what Mal are we going to read next? Well, and I think we're going to take a break from Mal and come back. In a large huh? way? Yeah. It yeah, did, I think I, I, I wanted to have you read a theoretical text. It's more about Mal's view of the classes in China in the 1950s Fantastic. and there the, the way they think the communist party should uh, align to it, which is, which is much more substantive because it's not agit prop. This is not, this okay. is an internal document. This sure. is uh this is for party members. It is not for like the general population in a wartime. Um, I think we're going to come back to that. Uh, so what we're going to do next, Jordan, and, and sorry to change stuff up on you. Um, is we're going to come back to Mal, but in between, because I think debates, there's debates that you need to understand mm -hmm. that are going to come up in Marxism uh, that, that that will be clearer if we've read this first. Yes. And maybe we should have started with this. Uh, we're going to do the critique of the Goethe program by, by Marx. Oh, I've read that, but I'm happy to read it with you. Absolutely. And the critique of the effort program and give you some context in the, the controversies around them. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to come back and do that class text on, on Mao. I think of the classes in China, Amazing. which is from actual, you know, when Mao it's before like the cultural revolution or even, or even like the anti riotist campaign, but it's, but it is, I think much more than this, like an act, like you get a feeling for what Maoism actually is. Um, when, and before because, anyone accuses me of being selfish, individualistic, uh, liberal, of course, just remember that I am the avatar of <laughs> of the learner of the masses. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> you can't accuse me of being liberal if I am a stand-in. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> no, I it's it, I, I it's funny because I was actually reading this and I'm like the problem with you, Jordan, is you've taken this too seriously. <laughs> I love that. That is my best <laughs> critique to date. I take it. Which which is normally but you know like, what, Varn? I'm gonna I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna try to improve myself. Okay. <laughs> yeah, take this and uh go self criticize and uh, <laughs> go take your criticism to the masses when you encounter them and uh, but yeah, I do think it's interesting. One of the things I was thinking about as I read this, uh, you know, I think the more fairer con uh, comparison other than fascist, although, like I said, I do think because this is so vague, you could, you could stick it in some like Goebbels mouth and it kind of makes sense. Um, I think that more accurate comparison where I've heard this kind of language about masses before mm -hmm. Is actually in the early liberal revolutions in the Jacobins and in like the Enrages and in um and in and even in the more radical end of the American Revolution, and so much that there is one, like you can hear you could hear this coming out of their mouths. Right. Like 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 really, if like think about Tom Paine, for example, and his like Fairweather Soldier speech, like that. Like this could easily 
you know, other than that last little bit at the end, easily come out of their mouths as agitprop, which tells me like this may be fine, but if you if you're trying to draw broad theoretical anything from this text, and people have, right, you're making a mistake. Absolutely. Right? And like last point on that, I think that in any time of war, at any point in history, for any cause, there's always going to be a call for the people to sacrifice themselves and to put their personal interests behind those of whatever X revolution fill in the blank. So, so uh, we're going to end on that. I'm going to, Oh, actually we technically have one last sentence to read. Oh two. God. We forgot the last sentence. Okay. I'm All loyal, honest, active and upright communists must unite to oppose the liberal tendencies shown by certain people among us and set them on the right path. This is one of the tasks on our ideological front. The end. Yeah, I mean, again, like, like I could see this coming out of fucking Eisenhower's mouth if it wasn't for <laughs> like the uh, the petite revolution, the petite bourgeois selfishness. Just, paragraph. just right. switch communists and liberal uh, upright liberals must unite to oppose communist tendencies. Yeah, the communist right. is a lazy type. <laughs> well, actually, holy shit, I have heard that. Like, I'm not like, kidding. Like, <laughs> um. I've just got to think about like what, like me watching in the eighties, fifties agit prop videos in school because because I'm old and we did that. Um, yeah. God, I actually one day someone's got to write a, a book about how much the eighties was actually informed by nostalgia from the fifties, but not like the social democratic part of the fifties, which people have nostalgia for now, but like the cultural weird shit of the fifties. Sure. Uh, Absolutely, which, um, because it really is kind of profound. Um, and anyway, we're gonna end on that, but we're gonna come back to Mal because we we have to, and we're gonna come back to Hal Draper in a long time. Um, I have so many other things we need to come back Excavate. to. Although, yes, I've yes. told you, there's a couple of key Hal Draper texts that I do think we need to do. I also, uh should do i'm going to do a video on excavations where i go through how draper and theodore draper's biography because someone mm -hmm. added me about it and they were right that i made two mistakes and then there were a bunch of interpretations that i want to defend but talk about why i made them interesting um like the independent socialist being related to the international socialist organization where that comes from how that happened um there are a few things about how that happened that i still don't know so i'm doing a little bit more research but like how did the Shackmanites be associated with Cliffites, et cetera? What happened there? Like, what was the relationship to the SPUSA? Uh, I called, I called, I will make this correction here. I called Theodore Draper an academic. He technically did not finish his graduate degree. Oh, really? Called, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Hal Draper, and I said he didn't, he did, but he didn't do it for a long time. So he graduated in undergrad in 1929. He didn't get his graduate degree till 1960. While and that was, was after while he was working at Berkeley. While okay. he was working that at, makes sense. at Berkeley. Um, but he never took a faculty position or anything like that. He was always a resident librarian. Right. Um okay. So let the record show. Yeah. And I we went also went back and forth about the definition of worker. Of course mm -hmm. we did. Um uh and the definition of communist, uh, because uh, I the the guy interpreted me saying communist as he was a prominent member of the CPUSA. I was like, no, he's just in the CPUSA. Sure. But I was just saying communist, like he yeah. was a communist at one point. Um, but uh, Theodore Draper did not finish his graduate degree. Degree how Draper did, but twenty years after the essay we read, mm -hmm. um, and what his else? brother Teddy was a Teddy Theodore as if I'm like his yeah. best friend. Was he? A, he was a party man as well. He was a he, he was, he was a different party. Way. He was actually in the CPUSA right, as opposed right. to. I don't know that Theodore was ever. I mean that Hal was ever in the was ever in the CPUSA. I don't think he was. Um, he was in the SWP at one point. Right, right, right. Um, right. the. But he leaves by the forties. The uh the last thing I want to correct, uh the reason why I said. Theodore was an academic, though, because he was accepted into the U.S. Amer Academy of Arts and Sciences. So, like, and he won some major awards on writing histories of communism. Sure. I'm um, sure that I read the, that he was an academic as well. So, so 
So technically, no, he was not an academic, but he was recognized as being one and all but actually finishing his graduate degree. Gotcha. So uh, that's the those are the corrections. Um, for those of you who want more of this, we're slowly reading uh, Kohei Sato's. Uh, Marx's eco socialism. Yeah, not the not the anthropop not the anthropocene one. The, nope, the Marx's eco socialism, which I am uh, which I am both impressed and angry with in equal measure. I think Jordan <laughs> likes it a little bit more than me. No. I get sort of, I get sort of <laughs> mad at it where I'm like, dude, you just told me that Marx didn't say what he said he said um, really because of a footnote on the back of a napkin, well. um, but. Uh, but anyway, it's not that bad. But it's I'd say I'm more amused and enchanted by it. <laughs> uh, well, the, no, it's the, really good reading, though. The scholarship in it's amazing, but some of the conclusions, I'm like, that's a stretch, bro. But like, you do love the the mic drops and the the backhanded yeah, slaps. Yeah, that are, are like, well, Mark said he didn't agree with this, but because he wrote this note on this piece of reading about science, I think he actually did. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, anyway, so you can read uh, Sato. We are also talking about eventually doing um, Mute Compulsion by Soren Mao, yes. who one day I may reach out to you to try to interview, although I've been told he's a much better interview in German than in English. I don't know. I watched him on um, uh, 990 in mm -hmm. English, and it was fantastic. Oh. All right. Uh, I heard him on uh, Antifada and I heard him on 99 to Eins, and which I'm going to not say in German. Uh, I'm going to half, I'm going to, I'm going to Dutch list it. 99 to Eins. Yeah. 99 to Eins. Because that's what I see in my head. I'm like, yeah, 99 to yeah. Eins. Um, but uh, um, I, I was, I thought his interview on, uh, on, uh, uh, on 99 was actually really good and yeah. I thought his interview on Antifada was really awkward and I didn't know what to make of that oh, so just blame um, Sean. yeah it's Sean's <laughs> fault uh, friend of the show and, and so occasional co-host Sean uh, no um, you apparently can't interview Germans um, but work on that it's, no, well, it's a good skill to have what is interesting is the mute compulsion, however, is one of the most polarizing books in the Varn community yeah. with half my discord thinking it's utterly stupid and a waste of time and the, and has nothing to do with Marx at all. Uh, and, and half of that, some of them are people who are Marx skeptical and others are people who are super diehard Marxist. And then, sense. and then on the other side, you have the same thing where you have people who think it's awesome, but they're like, it has, it's awesome and it's great, but they're either kind of anti-Marxist or they're super diehard Marxist and they're mm -hmm. split. So now I'm like, that's a weird split. I can't you gotta predict. get to the bottom of this. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I can't predict based off your stance on Marx, whether or not you think this is going to be good. So I gotta, we're going to do, that's our next series that may be made available for the public. If, you're I'm gonna go it. ahead and say uh, it may be made available for the public, but patrons are gonna get it first. Um, and we'll we'll have patrons vote. And if I have enough of them vote yes, and you want to vote on that to make it public, then uh, you need to become a patron. Uh, I, I hate how you managed that in the end. That was perfect. Um, so uh, for so I need to actually. I'm very bad at doing what all shows end up doing at the end instead of like you and me rundering off into a tangent about a joke um <laughs> that i need to actually close the shop so like and subscribe comment uh if you comment substantively i appreciate it i mean i like the comment for the algorithm but i want you guys to know the my youtube is not monetized because that means there's a lower threshold on what i get censored on saying and uh i actually prefer to get my money from my actual supporters as opposed to some random ass corporation um, so I'm not sure how those comments help me. Um, <laughs> they, they, they do, mm -hmm. but they're not weighted in the same way they are a monetized algorithm. So if you think I don't care, it's, it's kind of because I don't care. Um, but 
leave a substantive comment. I'd appreciate it if you do. I've gotten some interesting feedback from all kinds of ideological types. I've also gotten some things that have made me want to fight them and challenge the people to a duel, but the comments are in general better than, than bad. So uh, leave a comment, like, and subscribe, share. That's how this stuff grows when you're not monetized. Share it, please. Um, and if you don't like it, don't share it. I don't care. I don't <laughs> care. But if you like it, do share it. I would like people who would, who you think would like this to have access to it. Uh, Jordan, Jordan appears here uh, and on uh, another show of another uh, socialist um, who will, well, we'll just name them Ben Burgess. Uh, um, I was about to say who would not be named because we don't really share politics, but they're my friend. I don't want to make it sound like there's a weird. Well, you and I are going to be on, um, give them an argument for debate breakdowns on the third yeah, Thursday yeah. of every uh, month starting this. Month, I will so. represent the irrational zealot position. Yeah. Um, because that's what a lot of people in the G. That's not what Ben thinks of me, but that's what a lot of people in the GTAA world think of me. Yeah, <laughs> like listen, a crazy person outside of you know this particular circle. When you come onto a show and you relate to people in chat, uh, we call it getting varned, and more people uh, need to get varned. So. Oh, th that happens. Uh, I relate to people in chat as opposed to threaten them for being. <laughs> I mean, chat. sometimes you just correct their mistakes. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. Well, that's that's what Mal tells me to do. Exactly. Mal says you should not say any wrong account of revolutionary Don't statement let it and slide. let it go unchallenged. Just because and they I, are subordinates. <laughs> and I do not. I do not, like, even if they're like e even if they're paying subscribers to other people's podcasts that are not mine. Um <laughs> And I'm totally <laughs> risking their livelihood. I'm not gonna stop. No, um, it's fine. I may or may not moderate those chats myself, so <laughs> it's cool. And I'm otherwise here to think too hard about things, uh, yeah. ask serious questions, and uh, soften blows. I suppose. Yep. All right. And on that note, we're gonna go out with the uh, space music.